Good evening. Welcome to the Tuesday, April 24th meeting of the Town Council's Finance Committee. Um, I'm Jamie Garvin, Chair of the Finance Committee. Um, before we get to the agenda, uh, scheduled agenda portion, is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak um, about items under consideration on tonight's agenda? If you are interested in speaking, please come forward to the podium. Give us your name and address or affiliation. And um, if you could limit your comments to three minutes, please. Nobody? Okay. We'll move on to the agenda then. So uh, the purpose of tonight's meeting is to receive a presentation from the school board on their recommended fiscal 2019 budget. Uh, it is also an opportunity for the Finance Committee of the Town Council um, to pose questions, uh, raise points of discussion, uh, and so forth. So um, up until this point, um, I think most people are familiar with the process that uh, we've gone through, but I'll just recap a little bit. The school board has been uh, meeting and working and deliberating for um, a couple of months now. Um, and uh, at their early April meeting, uh, passed uh, the budget that is being presented to us today. Uh, we had a preliminary workshop um, preliminary workshop about a week ago, uh, at which point uh, we had some discussion about some of the challenging uh, uh, items facing um, this year's budget. Um, and from here, uh, we will have a second finance committee meeting tomorrow, uh, which will be ostensibly to pick up any loose ends from tonight, but also discuss some of the other items pertaining to the um, municipal portion of the budget. Uh, there will then be a public hearing on May 7th, uh, at which time the public will have opportunity to weigh in uh, on the budget besides the open meetings that we already have scheduled. There's also a meeting of the town council on the 14th, at which point the council will vote on the fiscal uh, 19 budget and then uh, the validation uh, of the school board, uh, the, of the school budget portion is to be held on June 12th. Um, so before I begin, are there any questions or um, initial comments that uh, anybody has that they wanted to express before we go forward? Elizabeth? Um, I know that I don't have standing to make motions at this meeting, but I'd love for the council to consider putting a hard cap on at 9.30 as we are meeting tomorrow night. Also because I believe that this matter deserves our best thinking and our deepest consideration, and my best thinking ends long before 9.30. <laughs> so I'd love for the council to consider that. So noted. Also, Jamie, yep. I just want to make sure we're on air. We don't see the on air sign. Uh, that's a good question. Perry, would you mind checking? Are we on air? Yes, yeah. The sign, the, okay. <laughs> um, any other questions, comments? Jessica? Uh, no. There we go. Can yes. you hear me now? Okay. I, I have a point of order um, that yeah, you're aware that I'd be bringing. Um, I brought this up on April 12th, and <clears throat> the point of order has to do with a, a, a a concern of bias on the, on the part of Councilor Chris Straw. Chris Straw is aware also, I would I'd be bringing this up again this evening. I did on April 12th and there was no resolution. Um, I asked the town uh, manager to check with the town attorney on procedure, so I'll let him relay what the town attorney said and then I'd like to continue the discussion. Yep. Matt. Yep, Mr. Chairman, yep. Thank you. Uh, at the last meeting of, well, at the last workshop, there was some question relating to uh, the number of times or if a person can come back to revisit the question of conflict of interest, and there was some confusion if you handled it one time, if you could come back and ask that question again. I inquired of the town's attorney if that was, a, if that was something that the council could consider again, and he said yes, basically. Uh, you know, if you decided at one time but new information may come to light, then you have the ability to revisit that decision and then reconsider that item. That being said, there's also Robert's Rules of Order, which is, you know, if, if a person brings up that question and asks if there's a conflict of interest and the council or the, the body votes to say no, uh, if the motion to reconsider, as the council is familiar with the reconsideration votes, has the ability to come back, as long as you're on the prevailing side, you can make the motion to reconsider. So 
uh, that's pretty much where, where we're at at this point in time. Hopefully that's helpful as far as considering the question. Okay. Yep. Thank Justin. you. So at, at this point, I'd like to essentially uh, ask the same question I did on April 12th of Councilor Chris Straw. Um, <clears throat> went, and just to tee it up a little bit on December, uh, Councilor Straw sat down for his first uh, meeting as a town councilor. He was just elected. His wife had just been elected to the school board. And Councilor Straw himself raised the issue of conflict of interest with regard to his potential voting on the school board. At the time, uh, we, we consulted with a town attorney who said no, he does not have a direct conflict of interest because his wife is not being paid to be on the school board. But I had have the concern of, of bias nevertheless. And so what I'd like to do at this point is ask Councilor Straw his feelings uh, and his thoughts on whether or not he can conduct his deliberations with the school board with bias, and then I have a couple questions for him. So, Councilor thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, phrasing it that way. Uh, very uh, productive. Um, I, uh, I guess I have a couple of points with respect to that. Um, the original question I had inquired about, as you noted, was with respect to conflict of interest as opposed to bias. Um, and. Thank you for clarifying that your questions now with respect to bias. Um, as an initial matter, for me, my understanding, and I completely acknowledge this my understanding, and it could be wrong, and it's up for you, your decisions, not mine. Uh, for me, um, we wear two different types of hats. We can be in our quasi-judicial role or in our legislative role. Right now, we're acting in our legislative capacity. We're, we're, we're deciding um, issue, it, it, what quasi-judicial is if someone comes in and says, um, I need an abatement on my taxes because of financial hardship or something. It, it, when you're acting in that quasi-judicial capacity, my understanding, the way I look at it, that's when everyone is entitled to due process of law, an impartial decision maker. Um, in in the, the standard, the, um, that's when bias comes into play. Uh, when we're acting in our legislative capacity, and again, this is just my personal view, and it, I acknowledge it could be wrong. The when we're acting as legislators, there is an expectation that people will have strong views on issues. It goes with the concept of how decisions happen when you're acting as a legislative um, uh, participant. Um, so that concern about bias isn't there in the same way when you're acting in your legislative capacity. So I just, I would note, to begin with, I don't think bias applies in this situation. It could be that under our code of ethics, it somehow does. Um, it, so to begin with, I don't think bias applies. I think it's conflict of interest. And that's where, if you get, but you guys can do what you want. Um, so do I think I have bias? So. Uh, for me, and if you have a different definition of bias or a different way of me, for me to look at it, please tell me. For me, when I, I uh, what, what's bias? It's have I closed my mind um, to any persuasion? Have I predecided my view on an issue? It's the I am fixed in my worldview and like it doesn't matter. I have shut myself off to persuasion. If that's the case, to me, that's bias. It's that's a textbook to, example of bias. Is that. Um, it doesn't matter, I'm deciding this way, I don't care what you say. I, so I have never said, and for frank, frankly, full disclosure, I actually don't know how I'm gonna vote right now. Um, it's, uh, I know which way I'm leaning, but it's really gonna turn on answers that we get here. Um, so I, for, as an initial matter, I'm, I'm open to persuasion, so I say I'm not biased. Um, but as, uh, furthermore, I've never said anything along the lines of like, I'm gonna vote for the school budget no matter what. I'm going to vote against the school budget no matter what. I'm always open to persuasion, and I kind of pride myself in that, even when it's things that um, otherwise would be difficult. So I apologize for being so long-winded, but um, and I realize I just rambled. Um, I'm sorry. So, but that, that's why that's my thought process. So. Thanks. Um, what, I, what I would like to point out, which continues to concern me, and I, I did on the 12th of April, uh, in the matter of paper streets, uh, you campaigned in favor of accepting paper streets. And after you uh, got on the council, you recused yourself from discussions on paper streets because your, what you said was, well, you know some of the people that are on, that abut one of the paper streets in question. 
And for that reason, you felt that you needed to recuse. And it, honestly, I don't remember, it was specifically conflict of interest or it was bias, but I, I see the two running kind of close in that situation. So my question is, or let me just say, I think probably you're, you know your wife much better than people that abut the paper street. And your wife is involved in crafting and advocating for an over $25 million budget. Um, I suspect that, you know, uh, that you would perhaps have bias or be concerned in a way of bias over, you know, a happy home, let's put it that way. And what I would like to say is, if you recused on Paper Street, the Paper Street issue, because you know people that live on a street that abut a Paper Street in question, aren't you using a different standard when you are not recusing yourself from the school budget discussion, given that your wife is actively advocating for, for this budget as a member of the school board? Aren't you using a different standard? Uh, uh, so, uh, thank you very much for phrasing it that way. Um, uh, I don't want to discuss, I, I'm going to carefully try to, um, as you know, there's pending litigation, so. Um, the conflict of interest rules, as I think I kind of conveyed my view on it, is as originally structured, they didn't make sense and set forth a standard that if you take, I. I tend to look at things in kind of black and white, and I, I, I don't necessarily incorporate a reasonableness standard when I read rules and things. It's, it's something I, I work on. But the way that it was written, literally the very first provision said, you are not allowed to take any vote that results in any financial benefit to anyone. So obviously, that's outrageous. That's not what was intended. So you have to start saying, and then, then, then we get on down to this farther part, and the issue that forced me, basically, from my perspective, is we had a list of examples. One of those examples, I think, was not what was intended by the conflict of interest rules, but clearly encompassed my situation. I didn't think it, in a reasonable world, I should have to be recused, but because that example exists and was directly on point, I was forced to make a decision. I squarely fall within this example. I think this example doesn't, it wasn't intended to encompass this, but it nevertheless says that it's there. It's kind of, it's from a, if you think about, I just try to avoid getting the flowers now. Um, it's, do you take a textualist uh, approach or do you take a, um, a, an intent approach with, with language this is from a court perspective? And I tend to adopt a textualist approach. And the language of it said, because of that example, in this instance it applies, the language is preposterous, but nevertheless it applies, and until we change it, which is why at the December meeting I had attempted, and I did a poor job of it, to get us to fix the language, uh, because it encompassed things that wasn't intended. So that was why, looking at it, it was, I clearly need to, I, I, I'm forced to make a decision. That I, I meet the letter of what's on the paper. I either say, I follow the letter that's on the paper, or um, I say, that's not what the, the intent is, and I'm gonna do something different. It's much like the, the letter on the paper said, we have to vote every time anyone discloses something, which was preposterous. Um, but nevertheless, the way that I deal with these things is, if it says it, I, I, try to, I do my best to follow it. So, but uh, to the point with uh, my wife, um, if we're looking at it from the perspective of bias, I mean, I love my wife, it means the world to me, um, but I, uh, no offense. <laughs> uh, I really love my kids. I got three kids in the school district. Um, I love my wife, but I really love my kids. Um, if you're looking, I have in, I think, I think I have more kids in the schools right now than the rest of the town councilors combined. So if you're looking for bias, it's the fact that my wife was one of seven unanimous counselors or uh, school board members behind a budget where, to my knowledge, the only item she actually advocated for wasn't even included in the budget. If anything, the argument would be that I'm going to oppose the budget because the item she wanted wasn't in there. Um, and it's also an item that I've always wanted and have complained about for seven or eight years. So she was, A, it was a unanimous vote. B, um, it, it, it's, it's noise compared to the fact that my kids are in the school system for me. And C, if having kids in the school system makes me biased, you just basically knocked every single school board in the state out. And half the town councilor is in the state out. And I also would arguably have a bias because I'm a taxpayer. Um, so I have an argument that there's, there's an interest there in trying to keep my taxes low. So I, again, I'm rambling, I apologize. 
Um, I hope I answered your question. If I didn't, I'll, I'll do my best to clarify. But. No, thank you. I mean, I, you make some very good points. I still, I still am concerned that there is an issue, but uh, <clears throat> I appreciate your thoughts. Um, and I, I, I do think you, I understand what you're saying about our rewrite, uh, which of, of our, uh, some of the verbiage, which I fully supported. I do think you are using a different standard nevertheless, but that is my opinion. Thank you. Is there any other comments? Sarah? I guess I disagree with Jessica. I don't see any, by any, any particular setup in the situation that would carry any more bias than a million other scenarios that we've worked with with counselors for years. I agree with Chris that having your kids in the school could potentially be seen as far more biased than your spouse. Um, and yet we have people, of course, on the council all the time who have kids. I also think that these are two extremely intelligent, you know, um, highly ethical people who probably disagree on a lot of things if their marriage is like mine. I mean, <laughs> they can love each other a lot, but they could be on polar opposites of this. I don't think, and, and, and I don't think in a modern world one would say, oh, I'll do what you want, honey, because I don't want you to be mad at me. I mean, so that they're married to me is virtually irrelevant. I mean, what if I had a best friend who was on the school board? That might have more influence on me than my husband. In fact, I can say pretty, pretty <laughs> surely it would. Um, what if, I mean, I can go on and on. We've had, we've had people on the council whose wives and or, and or husbands were teachers who, who collected a salary. To me, that's a far higher bar of potential bias. So I have zero concerns about this. I don't, I think Chris is more than capable of separating his wife's passions and opinions from his own. And if anything, I think he'll bend over backward to be more independent than say someone who sort of is just listening to the noise around them of the friend group they tend to hang around with. So not only do I not agree, I, I, I would actively discourage him from recusing himself because I think we need, <laughs> We need all seven minds on this working and figuring out what we're going to vote for. And I think he was elected to vote on things. So I don't know if we're going to vote on it or what, but I would strongly encourage Chris not to recuse himself. Other comments? Any? I won't hit you with it. I just want. Cool. Okay, you can hear me. Um, I just want to say that, uh, number one, I appreciate Jessica asking the questions because I think it's imperative that everybody who's watching this or in the audience recognizes that we take seriously what the rules, guidelines, procedures are for the town council. Uh, secondly, I want to say, and I'll reiterate what I said at our last meeting, I really don't think I've ever met a more uh, rules-based, principle-based person. And so when Chris sits here and says how he interprets the, uh, the rules, the charter, whatever, uh, he takes them to heart. And I, he's actually taught me a lot about them. So I would hope that he would not recuse himself, but I think it's, um, I think it's perfect that we had this conversation. So thank you. Other comments? I actually have a question, um, specifically to either Jessica or Sarah, because I think you're the only ones that have this past experience, but um, you brought up the example, and I was going to, if you hadn't, of um, previous counselors that have had spouses that are in the employ of the school department or administrators, um, and I'm just wondering how or if this had been dealt with in that instance. My, my recollection uh, was when Councilor Jim Walsh was a town counselor, his wife was a teacher, and I recall him recusing himself from the school budget vote. He may, I don't know how many times, honestly. I, I know that he did at least once. But we'd have to go back and look at the record because it may not have always been the situation. I think he sometimes did and sometimes didn't. Right. I, I, didn't, I didn't know why I agree. he would decide that. That was my recollection. 
And he wasn't, and Caitlin? he chose to do it just out of appearance sakes because it wasn't required because he actually had no influence on the actual money given to his wife. Like, because we're only approving a large number, it, it wasn't that he was approving how much his wife was being paid because we're not part of the negotiating team for their um, contract. So he just did it for appearance sake, is my recollection. Caitlin, I'm sorry, I forgot that you were, you had that experience too, so my apologies. Um, any other comments, questions? Okay. No motion, Jessica? Well, I'm happy to make a motion. I know it will not be supported. Um, so I'll go ahead and make a motion, and maybe it will or won't, will not be seconded, and then there will either be discussion or no discussion. So I move that we uh, rec recuse uh, Councillor Straw from school budget deliberations. Is there a second for that? I'm sorry, deliberations or vote or both? Uh, uh, well, it would have to be everything. It would have, yeah. So. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay. Is there discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion? Opposed? Motion fails. With that, we'll move on to the agenda. Um, so again, uh, the single agenda item for tonight is to receive the presentation of the school board's budget. Is there somebody who wants to lead that? I'll lead that. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you. Everybody for coming tonight and uh, giving us this opportunity to present to you in full um, the nuts and bolts of our school budget this year. Um, <clears throat> one of the topics that have come up uh, a couple times in the budgets uh, throughout the past several months has been how education has changed, how it doesn't look quite the same from 20, certainly 30 years ago. And I thought it would be um, useful to uh, create, to explain it through an analogy of how it has changed. And uh, the best analogy that I could think of was um, through healthcare. So allow me, if you will, just to peruse quickly about um, the changes to healthcare. Originally, as um, some of you probably remember, you, we began with a primary care doctor. Uh, they were trained and responsible for almost all aspects of our health. Um, the approach to medicine was much more paternalistic. Um, uh, you listened to what your doctor recommended and it was pretty much gospel. Um, there were much longer stays in the hospitals um, for various reasons. Uh, nurses were more supportive and less, less trained. Uh, and the view um, of healthcare was much more linear. Fast forward now, um, there, are special, there are specialists um, and there are advances in technology that have broken the mold. Um, no one doctor can, do, can know everything there is to know and, and never will. Um, due in part to low reimbursements for primary care, workloads, financial, financial pressure to have increased patient turnover. Uh, these are all factors in how it has changed. Um, and with the expansion of knowledge and technology, the demand for specialists and more training will only continue to increase. Um, along with uh, the change of um, paternalistic, it has become much more patient empowered. Knowledge and choices are powerful to patients now, and everybody is encouraged to do their own research. Thanks a lot, in part to, to internet, but also in part to having many, many choices. Um, turnarounds in hospital stays are much shorter, in part to save money, but also in large part because patients do much better if they stay less um, days in the hospital. They're more subject to illness and other complications if they remain, and um, emotionally they do better if they go home quicker. Um, uh, now, there are, there are still nurses, but there are nurse practitioners, physician assistants, all who have more training than before and, higher, and much higher levels of responsibility. It is no longer just the doctor. Healthcare prioritizes prevention. That is probably the most significant change in healthcare from at, at a minimum of 30 years ago. 
In addition to that, it is a holistic approach and an awareness that health is driven more by health care, by an awareness that health is driven more than by medicine. There are other factors, social, economic, and demographic factors that also influence our health. Hospitals are cultivating a culture of health and all the various modalities that serve it. For example, acupuncture is now covered by insurance. Um, much like healthcare, on many parallel fronts, um, uh, while it might be hard for some of us to, let's see, so much like healthcare, um, education started, at least when I was a kid, uh, where you had one teacher teaching most, if not all, of the subjects. The very few other teachers were on board to teach subspecialties like art or music. Um, Teachers were the disseminators of education and disseminators of knowledge. Students learned by rote memorization. Teachers talked and students listened. Content was delivered in a more linear fashion. There was a one-size-fits-all fits all approach to, to teaching. Individualization was not considered. You either got it or you, or you failed. Children with disabilities were separated and taken out of the classroom. Education was for imparting knowledge and, not, and enforcing rules. No individualization and no personalization. Much like healthcare, we now have a composite of specialists on board at our schools. Teachers are now facilitators of education in numerous and ever-evolving ways. They are teachers of knowledge, social thinking, and social awareness. Students are required to know more academically there are much higher pressures to be competitive and, and get the results so that they can enter competitive college, colleges and, and, and be accepted. What, what we were expected to learn in first grade, second grade, is probably already being taught in preschool. It, is, it has changed significantly. Teachers must teach students how to be flexible and adaptive, how to compete in a global marketplace where some jobs do not even yet exist. Now teachers differentiate instruction, reaching students at their individual levels. There's a need for smaller classrooms in order to address all the needs. Legislative changes mandating least restrictive, least restrictive environments have also increased um, the need for specializing. Teachers now have to teach all, all children whether they have disabilities like ADHD, anxiety, depression, or anger management, all of these have been on the rise and all of these are expected to be addressed and taken care of by the teachers. Education has taken on a whole new meaning. Much like in healthcare, it is holistic view of what education can be. It is knowledge, emotional, physical, and social development and support. Law has also evolved to enforce a new culture. From, from the years where we had a teacher, one nurse, or, and one administrator, and perhaps one gym teacher, we now have a long list of support in our schools, fortunately. We have regular teachers, special education teachers, ed techs, one, two, and three, reading specialists, math specialists, guidance counselors, social workers, technology integrators, foreign language, art music, occupational therapists, psychologists, and the list goes on. Um, there is a handout, I believe, that you have uh, that goes over staffing changes over time um, that can help um, illuminate some of this more clearly to you. Similar to education, healthcare has evolved into a new system that looks very different from what most of us grew up with. While it might be hard for some of us to understand the reasons behind these changes or even to recognize where the changes have occurred, Unless, of course, you have personal experience with it. For example, if you've needed surgery for carpal tunnel syndrome, or your child has needed a reading interventionist, just like in medicine, the changes have been made and will continue to be made. As in education, there are, as in education, they are made in medicine in order to uphold a Hippocratic oath to do no harm and to continue to be educated on how to provide the best possible care at all times. So for me, that is the nutshell of, of how education has evolved. Um, and then we can answer 
questions later on um, in the evening when we get to the question and answers. But I, I, was, I was hoping that this comparison between the evolution of healthcare and the evolution of education um, can illuminate some of this for the people who don't understand why we have so many different staff on board. John. John. <clears throat> so I, I would add to that, the reason you see this differentiation is that some of the instruction may not have changed in a class like physics, but the kids in that class are now different kids and they are now able to access that education and understand and get that education that they were not ever able to do before. Now that not meant to be your kid, but it's somebody's kid. And so there are people, there are kids that are now in mainstream classes because that's what's required by the law. And that's very different than it was 20, 30 years ago. And it's a really, I think it's a really good thing. It's a, and there are kids who are on the borderline and they benefited from those changes that help the kids who need it and the kids who need a little bit of it. Uh, and then also if you look at what we do at our schools in Cape Elizabeth, it's not just a regular average school. We really are aimed to point everyone towards our small, comprehensive, college preparatory high school. And what that means is we're really aiming very high for all these kids and we help prepare them to be college ready. And that requires a different level of support services and, and staffing than you would have at an average high school. And so you know, that's what we've built over time and that's what we hope to continue to support. On an interesting side note, there have been a couple of articles recently, one I think as recently as last week, and then another one um, later in March, um, talking about uh, student resource officers. And although we don't have one in our budget, uh, they were talking about how even within that subspecialty, the training and experience required to, to fulfill that job successfully requires much more than just your basic officer training. It requires emotional understanding of the children. It requires learning how to identify bullying and cyberbullying, de-escalation techniques, um, needs an awareness of child development and symptoms of trauma or other educational issues. This is as an aside of how, with knowledge and progress, it requires us to adapt. Um, and as you can witness from the staffing handout, our schools are built on the premise and the expectation that we will provide each and every student with the education and supplemental services needed in order for each child to learn, grow socially and emotionally, and become confident members of our society capable of fueling positivity, productivity, and kindness. This is what is best of our country and what our community has asked us to deliver. This is also the oath each school board member is asked to take upon being sworn in. The question is, how do we fulfill our duties to educate all children in the best manner possible within the context of the severe funding cuts our nation is facing? Do we accept the limits upon us by, do we accept the limits imposed upon us by drastic state funding cuts? Do we scrap programs? Do we regress and only educate within the bell curve? Do we turn our back on progress and best practices? No, we do not, not on our watch. We do not, we do not allow mediocrity to be our ruler. We prioritize education and model what it means to work for what we most value. As a town, we come together to remind us of the value of education and community and realize that we need to look at the two as a whole. As a whole, we examine and determine the steps we need to take in order to make it happen. The budget we are presenting to you tonight takes all of this and more into account. Amidst enormous constraints and sensitivity to taxpayers, this administration has accomplished a nearly impossible task of continuing to provide outstanding educational experiences and services to each child with an extremely modest increase to spending. As you see, our total budget increase is 3.1%, $762,263 more than last year. Of this amount, over 78% of it is spoken for by salary increases and health insurance increases. The, lar the health increase Health insurance increases are the largest hike in recent history at 8.75%. 
The salary and health benefit package we offer to our teachers is competitive with neighboring school systems, and it is not out of line. We value our teachers and staff very much and know that Cape Elizabeth wants to fairly compensate our teachers and support staff for their talents and commitment to our children. While we are currently going through negotiations for custodians, secretaries, and ed techs, we are currently contractually bound to the terms agreed upon for administrators and teachers within that three-year cycle. This year, to assuage concerns brought forward last year by Jessica that perhaps our negotiating tactics could be better served by a professional negotiator, we hired an attorney from Drummond Woodsum to participate in all stages of negotiations. Our contracts are equally responsible and attractive to our employees. There is always more that we want to do and could do, but this year it is about staying stable and weathering the storm. It is about maintaining what has taken this, dist this district years to build. With this in mind, we have added only two items to the budget that comprise the remainder of our budget increase. An additional custodian for $60,000 and a feasibility study by a local engineering and architectural firm in the amount of $249,350. We will talk explicitly about the details of the feasibility study on Monday, April 30th, but in the interest of being thorough tonight, this study will propose a plan that will greatly improve the overall safety of our schools and address long-standing facility inadequacies and ADA compliances that have been postponed for years. I think it's important um, as we explain the budget to um, consider it in context. And uh, in addition to um, some of the, the factors I've already listed of the cuts, um, it's also important to um, consider uh, the context of per pupil spending. And I'm, I'm asking John to go over that tonight. So I, I think you'll see in, in your handout section that there's a comparison of per student cost for Cape Elizabeth with some of the surrounding districts, and you'll see Cape Elizabeth is sort of right in the middle there. But I wanted to add some context to that, because it's, it's important sometimes, I think, to look just beyond the borders of Maine to think about what we, and because uh, we don't rank ourselves as Cape Elizabeth High School just in Maine. We, we really look, we have a national reputation and certainly a regional reputation. And certainly this, the colleges where we send many of our students recognize that. So if you look around uh, at the Northeast, in general, um, Maine has some of the lowest per student costs around. Um, Maine also ranks the lowest of, of, of average school systems uh, in terms of its ranking. If you look at U.S. News and World Report, which takes into consideration uh, college readiness, graduation rate, math scores, reading scores, pre-K quality, and pre-K enrollment, the, the top ranks the school district is Massachusetts, the second one is New Hampshire, the third one is New Jersey, the fourth one is Vermont, the fifth one is Connecticut. They're all in Northeast. Um, and they all spend substantially more per student than we spend. Massachusetts spends a, a, about $15,952. These are from 2015. New Hampshire spends about $14,697 per student. New Jersey is over $18,000. Vermont is just over $18,000. Connecticut is over $18,000. We spend in 2016, we spent 14160 Now, this is our school, and those per pupil spendings are of the average school in those states, and we hope not to be an average school. Question? Yes. Uh, while we're on this um, particular chart, I just, uh, in the interest of uh, complete transparency and full disclosure, um, if you break out this data between elementary and secondary, you end up with different results. In particular, if you break it out, what happens is Cape Elizabeth moves from kind of on the left side to the spending the second most on secondary education. So I understand in general, we may be at that location, but what I'm concerned about is the allocation within the district. So I see there are areas in the district that we are very, very leanly staffed, but there are other areas where we've deviated from our normal level of spending, where we are moving up towards the higher end. Um, so at some point tonight, I'd like to dig into that. So, so I, I yep. think even if after you do that split, we're still nowhere near the top-ranked schools in the Northeast. 
Uh, agreed. So, agreed. Uh, point yep. of relevance yep. is yep. to the Northeast, which has similar costs and populations and considerations. And I think if you'll look at things like real estate costs and, and wages and other things around uh, southern New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Vermont, et cetera, those numbers are actually very close. And we're still far below. I still think we're below those on the average school. So it's a point of contact for the average school. Yep. True. Yes. Can you tell us which school moves it to the right? <laughs> Or, or do you guys want to do that? I'm just curious, which school costs more per pupil than another? So if, um, if anyone cares, the same URL that's on the page, you can go and you can pull up eventually from the EPS data, break down by school. It's done on an operating cost instead of pupil expenditure. I scribbled it on my page. Um, my understanding of elementary and secondary is that secondary is the high school, but I'm not 100% certain of that. And that elementary encompasses the elementary school and the middle school, but I can't. Guarantee that. So which moves us to the right? The high school. And we'll get into that later. Thanks. By any chance, are you christened our school? Sorry, what was that? This is where your bias kicks in. By any chance, are you christened our school? I, uh, ironically, you could say that my kids, none of my kids are in the high school yet, but they're the ones that will be shifting into it. So arguably, oh, yep, yep. your bias kicks in with the right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and Chris, I would yep. also suggest if you actually do that same split on the regional numbers I just said, those numbers will also go up substantially because always secondary the, is, is higher than the average one. So all those numbers I mentioned go up higher. When they get to high school. Yes. Yep, yep. Go ahead. I mean, I'm here tonight to talk about a budget. I am not here to talk about the high school. Um, if we, if, if the town council is interested in knowing about our high school, our school board, I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume, would be very willing to have a meeting and talk about high school and what's entailed, what we offer. Um, but I can't imagine tonight spending we have t t maximum two nights here to spend, to go in depth, and it, which just really deserves, it really deserves a thoughtful explanation. I don't know how we fit that in and cover a total budget. I mean, that's an interesting conversation. I'm not saying it's a bad topic. I think it's a provocative idea to, to, to explore, but I'm just not thinking this is the right time for that conversation. I think that we ought to be tonight and tomorrow night helping explain this budget to you answer your questions about this budget, not about why the high school is spending more money per child than the elementary school. I mean, it's somewhat, it's a separate, it's related, but to me it's a separate conversation with all due respect. So, but I offer these regional numbers, because like I said, I think it is important to look beyond the borders of Maine in terms of looking at what you're spending and what you're getting. And so I offer those just as a, as a, as a touch point for what our spending looks like. So in preparing for tonight's meeting, it's natural to review the process thus far and self-assess. The takeaways are both pluses and minuses. First, when building a budget, it's imperative that a district's strategic plan and goals provide the roadmap. This year, with all the difficult circumstances that were thrown our way, we managed to handle it and support our strategic plan. However, given the limited amount of bandwidth caused by caused by these challenges, we were not able to approach our budget with many new goals at play, nor with as much creative resourcing as we would have liked. We do expect that this time next year, with a permanent superintendent in place and little to no administrative changes, that we'll, we will be able to expend our energy in innovative ways rather than expending them simply to stay afloat. Lastly, before we open up discussion for questions, I think it's important to take note of the successes of this district within the context of a very challenging year. Despite budget cuts, storm days, snow days, lack of power days, threats to schools days, administrative turnover, leaking ceilings, rusty doors, crowded cafetoriums, and lunches served at 10.30 a.m., despite all of it, our district has succeeded. Our students continue to be focused, engaged, and caring citizens. They are recognized for their talents in academics, music, debate, sports, and activism. They model grit and resilience. We continue to have an extremely low dropout rate of around 98 to 99 percent. 
in comparison to the majority of Maine and many, many communities throughout the country, this is a very impressive statistic. Our students are empowered to continue throughout their lives contributing to society and the world at large. We have engaged in restorative justice, which has increased student empathy and meaningful outcomes. Extracurricular involvement is at an all-time high, especially now that Club Unify has been brought to our schools, bringing even more students to extracurricular activities. We have hired a new superintendent after two years of searching that brings a wealth of experience, knowledge, and successes of her own. We have hired three new administrators and one new director of facilities and are very pleased with the outcomes. Despite the disruption that changes in administration can, can create, we are doing something right because our teacher turnover rate is extremely low. This is not common in other districts. Teachers want to work here, and once they do, they rarely want to leave. This is emblematic of a positive and high-functioning paradigm. Through efforts aimed at improving the climate and culture within our schools, teachers are reporting an increase in morale and an increase in supportive leadership. We have rolled out our first year of proficiency-based diplomas within, with, this, with this year's freshman class with very few glitches and an understanding and acceptance from our community, which is also unlike very many districts. Professional development, that, professional development has been consistent, predictable, and with a schedule that has fewer disruptions and more teaching time than in previous years. We have made significant progress with curriculum alignment. We have improved continuity through the grades, horizontally and vertically. Teachers deliver the same curriculum per grades, and upcoming teachers know exactly where to pick up from, as well as developing curriculums that build skills and increase knowledge base in a logical sequence. We have identified serious areas of security within our school buildings and have embarked upon a process of addressing how to best improve with a forthcoming facility study. We have also cultivated a strong relationship with a local architect and engineering firm that, that wants to do all they can to help us improve. All CIP projects on the list from last year have been completed, including summer projects that were, were completed one week ahead of time, allowing teachers to enter their classrooms earlier than usual. This is our first budget season where no time has been used to bring our itemizing of budget categories into compliance. With all the, cre with all the credit thanks to our business manager, this has left more time for true data collection and analysis. Finally, we have a highly committed school board with members who greatly value communication, transparency, and a very strong work ethic, even if it requires 31 executive sessions. <coughs> At this point, I would like to open the floor unless any school board to, to questions, but first, since we were given questions in advance from one town councilor, I, I feel that that's probably the best place to start. Okay. So, um, these, uh, we appreciate receiving questions came in from Mr. Straw, and we've been uh, trying to our best to answer as many of them as we could. We didn't get them all answered, but we can answer the rest later, but you can have a copy of this and we'll march through it together. Um, and extra copies would be available to the audience. I, I will say, kind of just get this started on, on the details of the budget. As has been mentioned by Susanna, this budget is up, um, I believe it's 3.1% budget to budget. And as has already been said, the, the primary additional cost are negotiated um, salary increases for employees, we feel good about that. They're competitive, they're fair, they're, they're deserved, um, and they aren't outlandish. Um, I think um, that coupled with the, again, uh, unusual cost increase for, benefit, for health benefits due in large to employee use of, of the plans. We've had some very costly health um, problems for some of our employees. 
our local experience rating drives those increases. That's why they're up so much. Um, we can't control that. We've had some really good run of years with one, two, and three percent increases. So um, this is gonna happen, it, it did. Um, but you take that and then you add the cost for, to get started with a detailed assessment of our three schools of about $250,000. You add in one additional custodian. And again, we added a custodian last year. The custodian was meant to go to the high school. He didn't go to the high school. He went to the town pool, but that's fine. But we're paying for it. We need another custodian to do exactly what we thought we were going to be doing this year. We need a custodian at the high school. We actually need more than one custodian. We, I think what we were asked for by um, Mr. Shores was two custodians and one maintenance person, and we simply can't afford it. These same requests were made last year by, um, by, by Mr. Morales. So this is not a new idea of staffing, it's the same message, we're understaffed. But we have one custodian in here. We also have a social worker, um, and that position is being funded next year out of a grant, so it's not included in the budget. Um, we have reduced teaching positions by a fraction below two full-time positions. And um, so we, we actually will have two fewer teachers next year than we have this year. Uh, it isn't two positions, it's one full-time and a couple of part-time, but the equivalent is roughly two positions of teaching positions are, are down. But that's, that's it. That's, this budget is up 3.1, and that's what we can control, and that's what we are here to explain and defend. We aren't able to um, solve the problem of the tax rate going up 10 point, what is it, I think it's 10.2? 10.2? 10.2. That's um, a bitter pill to swallow. Um, it is caused by one thing, a significant loss of state revenues for, I think, the third year in a row. And that um, is what it is. And I guess ultimately it's going to be the decision of town council if you can support that. Uh, we believe it's um, absolutely exp um, justified, but ultimately we appreciate that it's going to be your call. So if you want to, we can kind of march through, I'm sorry. Uh, you, uh, you, oh. uh, I realize people probably need time or maybe you want to march through them, but I've already reviewed the answer. And so, uh, if it's more time effective, I'd love to jump into this. Um, and first off, thank you so much for putting this together. I greatly, greatly appreciate it. Um, is it okay to so just jump in? All right. Uh, so first question for people out there watching the audience, how many children are currently registered to start kindergarten fall 2018? You say 104. What, the reason I was trying to get at this, and people are going to think I'm schizophrenic here, um, I, to take a step back, we just set the top level number. You guys decide the policy of how it's applied. We say this is how much should be spent and you drive the, how, we have no say how things go into. So when I'm asking about all of this, it isn't because I want to like, ah, oh, spend money here, spend money there. It's that we need to determine, can you get by with less? Um, at least that's my worldview of this. Can you, can you get by with less? Is there any way things can be moved around in a different way that you can get by with less? So that's why I'm looking into this. But, so, but, 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 oh, go ahead. Maybe go. join in. Yeah. It, 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 the, 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 fine, we can decide if you find we can do it with more or less, but ultimately your decision is about a dollar amount. Yep. And yep. you may decide that we can do, that we need actually two more kindergarten teachers <laughs> You see where and, I'm going. <laughs> and, and one less physics teacher and one less drama teacher. And guess what? The board will ultimately do what it needs to do with what it's been ultimately been handed for a total dollar amount. You're absolutely correct. Okay. Totally agree with you. It's at the end of the day, um, I, I could say I think you need to cut uh, two teachers and the school board could respond by act, uh, by axing the robotics program or something. We have no control over how it's spent. Right. Uh, I totally agree with you. Um, but again, it's the, is the room. So uh, I'm going to be saying, oh, my, my, many of these questions are directed at, to, uh, at are we properly staffed? Or do we have too much staff? Do we have too little staff? Uh, could we get by with uh, changes in staff? Uh, and um, I 
I've been asking for a finance director for the town um, because what I, at the end of the day, and it's not fair to put it on any of you at this point in the process, I'd love to be seeing three to five year planning with this. So our staffing shouldn't be driven on how many do we need exactly this year. Totally agree with you, it's not a mathematical calculation, um, but it should be driven with some eye to how many are we gonna need five years down the road. So that's kind of where I'm coming from with all this. So let's start with the kindergarten. So you say 104, so we currently have 104 students uh, registered for kindergarten. We had 100 a, a few weeks ago or a month ago or so. So I look at your budget currently, you're anticipating six uh, kindergarten teachers currently. If, as you say for this next answer, 110 is a good estimate. If we come in at that number, uh, my calculation is that we're at 108% of EPS. 108% of, we always say EPS is for mediocrity, we're better than that. But what we're looking at then is classroom sizes, I don't have this number right off the top of my head, let's do it quickly. Uh, we, we're, we're breaching our uh, classroom size policy. So uh, when I look at that, the reason I'm asking for this is now mentally in my head I've notched, you might end up needing an additional teacher for kindergarten. So when figuring out the budget, we gotta make sure that you have some buffer if you have to do that shift. Right. So that's why I asked those first two questions. Um, next questions that I asked were, uh, how many superintendent transfers are currently in the district? For those who don't know. I'll give you a quick color on the, sure. to the kindergarten numbers. So two quick things. Last year at this time, I think it was 71 yep. kindergarten registrations. We had historically low kindergarten registration. Even in spite of that, our total enrollment remained flat. Mm -hmm. Okay, so and also if you look ahead, the replacement rate on average is about 120 students if we're going to stay at 1613 grades. So we're in that range, give or take. It's, it, yep. it, it's not an alarmingly below what the replacement rate is, and, that, and that's just you, you add a few throughout the other grades as well. So that, that's an important level of context overall for what you're looking at for the further out and what we were last year. Thank you. Uh, so superintendent transfers, for those who don't know, and correct me if I get any of this wrong because I'm a layperson, this is just my general knowledge and I probably am gonna get it wrong. My understanding is there's a concept in the state of Maine that uh, children that reside outside of district can uh, apply or otherwise the superintendent can grant the ability for those children who live outside of district to attend a different district. My understanding also is that we are barred from charging for that. So that if there's someone from outside of Cape Elizabeth who attends our schools, we just have to eat the cost. Um, am, am, am I getting that right? No. No? Okay. Please, I, I apologize then. Uh, um, can you we, clarify? We, what, what, um, what drives these decisions and they're, um, they're year by year, if you have a student that transfers from one district to another, they have, would have to reapply every other year going forward. It isn't a guarantee. And, and the, the, the bar you have to get over is you have to be convincing to the two superintendents that it's in the child's best educational uh, it's, um, benefit that they attend another school. Um, and we take them very seriously and look at them one by one and and if either the superintendent is going to accept or send the student don't agree, that then goes to the commissioner of education. And the commissioner then weighs in and makes a decision. And if the parent is not satisfied with the commissioner's decision, they now have the right to appeal to the state school board. Meanwhile, the child can be in the school where the child wishes to go to school, the parent wants the child to go to school. What, at the end of the year, we turn in a, a, a list to the state of the children that we receive from other districts, and we receive an amount of money, uh, some kind of a formula. This last year, it was $66,000 um, that was um, sent to us by the state, and, and that went into unanticipated revenues. And that money is held there for the, for, for the year for offsetting future taxes. But it's nothing close to what would be the actual cost of the education for a child. And just to be clear, I'm not in any way advocating revoking them from existing students, just to be clear. It's the, do we have a mechanism to be more restrictive going forward? That's, that's why I raise it. Um, so uh, I've already asked a bunch here and I'm, I'm gonna defer if anyone else wants to ask any other questions right now. Do we wanna continue addressing the ones that we have before us or? Or if other, if other people want 
to jump in with a question or specific follow up to any of Chris's? Penny? Um, I don't know if this is quite a question, um, but first of all, I have to say that I value education and the schools in the town more than you can even imagine. I appreciate it. Um, I respect the staff. I admire all the work that you have done. But when I step back and I look at this, um, and I look at this budget, and I look at the past three years, the writing has been on the wall. It has been there. We know that Cape Elizabeth is not funded uh, uh, significantly through the state. We have to rely upon our own resources to do that. And for three years, the writing's been out there. Mm -hmm. Revenue has been reduced, but yet we look at um, we look at salary and benefits keeps creeping up. And when your salary and benefits are increasing faster than your revenue, you got to back off and you got to look because uh, you can't stay in business if, you're, if your employee costs are going up faster than your revenue. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say some really challenging things here, and I probably won't be very popular in the town as of tomorrow. But if I start looking at, I don't want to touch, I don't want to touch teachers. They touch the kids every single day. But I think we have to start looking at an organization and saying, how do we reduce staff in order to achieve our education goals and at the same time achieve those education goals. I think it was Mr. Gross who was here about two weeks ago and he hit the nail right on the head. If we don't start reducing staff, we're gonna be back here year after year after year after year asking the citizens of Cape Elizabeth to continue to uh, to fund a business, and I'm sorry to use that term, uh, that has costs increasing faster than revenue. And so I'm going to say, why don't, we get, why don't we reduce staff by saying we're going to have principals, um, a principal that does Pond Cove and middle school. We have two assistants, we have a high school principal, and an assistant principal. Why don't we take a look at um, other, I would say, positions that are not direct to the students in the classroom? Why don't we start looking at how over time we are going to start reducing the number of people who are taking, what was it you said, 78% of the budget or something like that? Mm -hmm. How do we start looking at, if I owned a corporation and I looked at that graph that shows the uh, number of teachers and the years of service, this is why I'm not going to be popular, what you do is you start looking at your highly compensated employees and you start asking the questions. How do we start reducing costs? And it's what we have to do. And it's the hard questions. I believe in innovation, but you can't innovate if you're dumping all your dollars into maintaining. And so you've got to figure out how do we reduce the dollars uh, that are just keeping status quo. And so that's the question I would put forth to the school board. So, Go ahead, I respond? Please. Yeah. I, I, I'm not um, disappointed at all in your hard questions. They're fair. Um, I, I, there, there's been a, a simple um, answer, as I'm sure you, you know to all this. I mean, we, our schools on average are about um, 525 roughly per school. That, that's a, a rough number. And that would be um, a lot to deal with for just one administrator. Right now we have two, as you said, in each building. If, and again, going back to um, points that have been made earlier tonight about schools being different, the, the principals in each of those schools function in different ways. 
Um, they don't do this. They, they have not got the same job, but they're busy and they're working with parents and they're working with students and they're working with guidance and they're working with teachers. They're evaluating teachers. They're attending required meetings. I mean, legally required meetings, not just ones that we think that are important, but we have meetings in, in special ed that require an administrator to be in attendance and to be the administrator. You, you, you would be so thin, I think, um, that pretty soon it would start falling apart. I mean, I, I don't, it could happen, but I think what we, we, we would do is that we would find ourselves in two years from now, teachers saying, this school is not functioning the way that I, it should and what I'm used to. Um, uh, I need somebody to help me with, with a child. I need somebody to help me with a parent. I need somebody to attend this meeting. I, I, need, some, I, I need feedback. Um, so all those teachers that you and I both really sincerely admire need a, a guidance, support, um, advice. And we have a lot of parents that are coming in asking for, and students coming in asking for attention and, and responses. So I, I think that if we were to say that, if the board were to say, um, we'll just t we'll do without assistant principals, I think that it would be, um, a, a, it, it wouldn't take long for people to realize what um, that is done that is unappealing and, and un, it was not the, the intent by taking away those positions. I, I, I mean, it, it, if it has to happen, um, it has to happen. I mean, I, 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 if, if our budget is going to be cut drastically, all those positions have to be on the table. They were on the table earlier, by the way. I, I was asked by the school board to look at a budget that had an increase of taxation, I believe it was five and a half percent. Uh, taxes to taxes. And I think that was taking the budget down by about um, 1.25 million. And when you start getting into those numbers, you're gonna be sure there's some administrators in there. It can't just be teachers. And so we've, we've had those conversations and um, it, just, it just didn't seem that it, it well, we came here with the idea that we needed to show you a res what we feel is a responsible, defensible budget. And we think that having two administrators per building fits the bill. But we also respect that um, you, you may not agree with, with that, or you may agree with that, but you realize you've got the, the challenge that you just articulated. And so here we are to hear from you. Can I, can I do a Go ahead, Penny. Um, I think um, I think if if action had been taken previous years that I and I I really think that we have to create confidence that uh, there's a recognition that something significant has to be done. And I think that if there uh, was demonstration and recognition, and, and I'm not saying you guys haven't worked hard, um, but I think in order for the town, the citizens that talk to me, uh, in order for them to believe that, okay, I can do this, I can do this this time, but I need to know that there's gonna be some action um, happening in future years. I did the numbers, I played numbers. The, and I know class size, I know all of those things. The numbers are going down. You got two years where you got a blip, and then they go right back down again if you use certain assumptions. And I had to use certain assumptions based on trend. And so I went out one, two, three, four, five, six years. And as I start looking at it, it's like we need to look at that and say, what are the things we need to be put in place in order to take care of the blip? And right after that, this is where we, where we will go. 
and we will not compromise the quality of the education for our kids. Um, and that's, that's what we need to be looking at because it, it can't be always, well, if we get rid of this, then this will happen. It's like, yeah, stuff's going to happen and you've got to compensate for it. That's what we do every day when we yeah. run a business. Yeah. Um, Any questions or comments? Heather? Um, thank you, Penny. And um, I agree that this is a bigger issue. Uh, I just want to speak kind of specifically to the comment um, about the teachers and how you don't want to touch the teachers and the teachers who are touching the kids directly. Um, and in speaking to that, I would just like to say that the teachers are working so hard. I, I've talked to so many teachers, and every year more and more and more is getting thrown at them. Um, by state mandates and what's expected of them. And I would just like to say that um, the principals, the vice principals, the social workers, the OTs, the special ed, all those extra people that are behind the scenes are the ones that are holding these teachers up to be the rock star in front of the kids to do their job. Mm -hmm. And backing away on those, those uh, this is to support what Howard said, it, it would unravel those teachers taking away some of that support. And we have, we have looked at it, and, and, we have, and we have analyzed it, and we have tried suggesting taking away this person or that person or this person or that position. And ultimately what it does is it makes the job in front of the students, the teacher, the frontline person, that much harder, and therefore that less effective and it does have an impact on the kids. I think I, I can, I can mm -hmm. respond to that because Penny, can you use I the said mic? the kids that... Penny, can you use the mic? I said the, the staff that works directly... I was a social worker in a school. Mm -hmm. I know what social workers do. Mm -hmm. I know that they are key to helping get those kids through school. Mm -hmm. And so what I said are those staff members that directly touch those students and create that whole... Uh, environment that allows them to thrive. Right. We have to focus on yes, that. Yes, but I'm That's also suggesting more. that there are people behind the scenes that are supporting those people who are touching those I students understand. that are very important, that may not have direct contact with the students. Um, for example, custodians. Like, you, you have to have them. They don't have direct contact. They're here when the, the students aren't even here. But they're vital to the functioning of the school system. So. Um, yes, and, and I, I, I'm not trying to negate what you're saying. I understand that there's hard questions. I understand that there's the bigger picture and looking into the future and all of that. I just want to point out that whether there, this is a team effort with the whole district and all the, all the personnel working here, and that we have looked at them all. And the teachers are like the rock stars standing in front of it, but you've got this whole crew that their fantastic show cannot happen without that happening. And um, so I think I've made my point. No, I think but that's good. Thank you. Sarah? I mean, just to go big picture philosophical, it's, I mean, I think the bigger question here is what do we as a community want? I mean, I, I don't think think you can cut too much without compromising the quality of the education we deliver. Because as Heather points out, if you're not teaching, you're every, essentially everyone who's there is supporting kids' education. So we need to decide how much we value a high education. I think if you look around the country and you see towns that have chosen in districts and communities and even states that have chosen to not have such high taxes and taken a lot of money out of their schools have deeply regretted that for many reasons. It tears at the fabric of the community, their house values go down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. P young p parents don't want to move there. So while I completely agree that we can't just have runaway spending, um, you know, it's interesting that since we've had a vote every year and we've put out the school board budget, the town has voted in favor of it um, by a fairly sizable margin. So. I don't see this wave of protest. Granted, we talked to different people, and I understand there are people in town who are very upset about their property taxes. 
Um, I would like to see us put way more work in getting our fair share of the state funding because we, we, we get ridiculously um, shortchanged every year. I agree with Chris, we should have a coalition in Southern Maine. I think we should have way more conversations. I think we should be electing people to the state that really fight for us. I know there's a whole different conversation, but to me, the problem isn't in spending. It's not in what the school board budgets, school board brings to us as budgets. This would be like every other year with a 2%, 3%, which I think is kind of what Maine looks at now. It's not that unreasonable. It's not as unreasonable as our state and federal taxes. It's, that it's, it's a 10% because of our state funding, period. So to me, um, in addition to taking a close look at who's there and can we cut down, I totally agree with that. You want to be as efficient as possible. Can we somehow address the fact that every year we get less state funding than virtually any other town? Um, it's a revenue problem. I also think I agree with people in town who say we, it'd be nice if we could look more seriously at generating some revenue in our own town. So I guess my proclivity is to say, let's see what the, what the, the folks in Cape want. Let's, let's let them vote. You know, they may vote no, and then we'll, we'll find something out. Anyway, that's my point of view. John? So, I, I just like to, to, first of all, I, I appreciate your comment, and, and I share many of the same feelings. Um, but I have to, I want to tell you how we came to where we ended up. Um, I, I have to disagree with you that, that we could expect this cut in state funding because it's, it makes it sound like it's the same thing every year. And it's not been the same thing every year. Not been the same thing at all. It's been the same effect. It's always been something quite different. So I was actually somewhat optimistic this year when they increased overall funding for all of education. Right. But the devil's so in the details. Yes. <laughs> because that's not what really happened. As, I, as I've explained before, while they increased the total amount for education in Maine, what they also did was increase more than that what was required to be spent which disadvantaged Cape Elizabeth substantially. So that's not what happened last year. Last year it was something else. Last year they didn't fund the total amount by nearly as much. So, is, so when you say you can expect it, 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 it's not the same thing. It is the same result. And the thing is, and you talk about going on and on and on and on, frankly, we're at the point now where you know, we're at a 1.2 million support. If we're a minimum receiver, the report is somewhere around 400 some odd thousand. There's almost nothing left to cut. We can't, we won't be in this situation to nearly the same. There will never be three years of cuts that look like this because there's not that much to cut. We've lost 62% of our funding. In, you, know, so you can't cut an additional 62%. That's more than 100%. We're not going to zero. So, you know, when you look at what's unsustainable, the level of state cuts is what's unsustainable. And I think I would echo what has been said before in terms of we need to get organized and uh, as a town and as a region to get our fair share because the, the, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of good things about the funding formula and there's a lot of really problematic things about the funding formula. And we, we've just been sitting here and letting it happen. And if we continue to do that, then yeah, we will be, you know, continue to have um, these kinds of swings, but they're, they're never gonna be like this three year period. You can't, you can't go below zero. You can't actually go below 400,000, which is where we're at in terms of the minimum receiver. So, and so when we put the budget together, we really looked at educational impact and we trimmed a lot of places. And we've said before, this is not a one year problem. There are things we put off, we know they're coming back. But we put them off for now because we thought we have to. And we did that so that we thought we could preserve as much of the educational quality as we have. And we could spend less money. We certainly could spend less money. But don't kid yourself that there's not going to be an impact on education because there will be and it will, it will be significant. Heather? Um, I would also just like to point out in our process uh, when we went through this and we had the presentations from the three principals and um, the business manager, there is a list in our binder, I don't know if it made it into your binder, but the proposed positions, um, for for example, a learning strategist in Pond Cove was asked for or discussed 
Um, there was also a clerical um, person in the business office. Uh, there were response, um, what is it, responsive classroom training teacher, uh, nursing administrative assistant because the nurse is so over. And so that's just a few of three or four of the 13 that I quickly counted right here. And I have to say, every single one of those sounded very necessary. None of it sounded frivolous. It's, I mean, I remember uh, Catherine Mesmer's conversation of saying, you know, the, the staff in her office, they are so overworked, they're, they're working overtime, the nurses are working overtime, that um, the needs of what is being asked of teachers and districts by the state is just growing. And we didn't add any of them. So, so we may not have cut a lot, we didn't add, except for the custodian, which we thought we had last year and we desperately need. So in that sense, I feel like we were being frugal about it. We had some retirement. We absorbed the equivalent of two positions, one full-time position and two part-time positions. So we're trying to make a dent in it without cutting so much that it has the effect on the quality of education that is being offered. And that's being expected by many of the citizens for the students here. So I'd just like to consider what we didn't put in, what was given to us as a wish list, that seemed very um, vital and important. It was hard to say no to, but we said no to it. Um, so it, it, it's not as though, and I, I'm not saying that you assumed this, so please don't think that I'm saying that to you, but it's not as though we didn't make the hard choices. It's not as though we didn't um, say, no, we can't do this. So I think that's important to note. Jessica, then Chris. Um, I, I'd like, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yep, that's good. I'd like to go back to the, uh, the funding formula, if you will. I know that's, uh, the, the drop in funding has been raised, um, you know, a great deal by the school board, and and there have been, you know, there's been a, a great outcry, and the term devastation is you has been used, and and I was trying to figure out really what was going on, so I went to Augusta, and I met with a Mrs. Ms. Paula Gravel, who is the school finance coordinator for the EPS, and. Um, and it was an excellent meeting and I learned a few things. This was yesterday. Um, we, you know, we have lost funding, um, but I'd like to put this into a little bit of a perspective. <clears throat> One of the, the, the various factors are involved are in enrollment, town valuation, the number of free introduced lunches we give, uh, uh, English language learners, and class size. These are the these are the biggies. We're down currently. We're we are going to receive for 19 one million two hundred sixty eight thousand three five hundred thirty two. Correct my figures if they're off. That's down. I I come up with that's down eight hundred and seventy five thousand. It changed from last year. Correct. Okay. I'd like to point out that this number fluctuates all the time. The school, our school department has averaged 2.4 million since 2001 in, in state aid, in the GPA. Last year, we were down 492,000. In fiscal year 16-17, we were down 1,271,456. In fiscal year 15-16, we were up. We got, we got 921,545. So the figure, the figure jumps all over the place. Again, since 2001, we've averaged to almost two and a half million. Um, and what, what we're getting this, this year for fiscal 19 is, I believe, actually the third lowest since 2001. So this is not the lowest we've ever, we've ever gotten. But again, our enrollment continues to decline. They pointed out to me yesterday in Augusta that we are down 8.5 students, um, and this is calculated as of October 1 of the two prior years. So I, you know, I'm sure Howard is aware of that. So, uh, you know, this is this is the reality we live with, Jamie. Can I ask a question on your? Yep. I, just so I heard you correctly, you said 
this amount of funding this year is the third lowest over that period? I'm sorry. Well, I was looking at it's one point uh, one point two million. It just differs from the information and, in our binder. That's why yeah, I'm looking. No, at well, I'm, I've got the spreadsheet here, and one year it may be it may be the you know I may have misspoke. It might be the lowest, but we had one year in 2004 just one point seven million. We've had one point eight million. Right. So this is the lowest. I'm sorry. Okay. But my point is, we jump all over the place. And the factors are related to town valuation and enrollment. And then we have other factors that come into play. And so my point is, the reality is, this is the way it is until the legislature changes the fund form funding formula. Right now, uh, Maine is spending $2 billion. Uh, that's the cost of education in the entire state. That's what it should cost. There only is $1 billion. Um, there was a change to 100% valuation, which Howard can explain a little more, but I learned about this yesterday, which the legislature put in for this year, which has caused some of these difficulties. You're quite right when you say that. I learned about that last yesterday. But what I'd like to say is echo some of, of uh, you know, Penny Jordan's comments, which are, you know, we need to take a very hard look at what we're doing um, because this, this is an unmistakable trend. And we also have declining enrollment. I mean, since 2006, we're down 248 students um, from a peak of 1847. And so you put that all together and, um, I, I, you know, it, we, we do need to look at these numbers. I think this, these are very serious. And this is a trend across the state. I mean, you know, we have a couple of uh, communities that are, are gaining, but we're not. And many aren't. Chris? Uh, so thank you very much for bringing up the EPS formula. Um, I swear I'm not going to go too in depth on this. Uh, but I did want to push back a little bit on the declining enrollment. Our enrollment's actually rising. Um, if you look at the, the estimates for next year, I think are wildly conservative. Um, they just assume no growth across the grades, but if you actually, as Penny noted, um, go and look at the trends going back, it's much more reasonable to assume there's a couple outliers, but a two to five student growth across each cohort as you go forward. So to assume that there's not gonna be a great uh, growth on those grades, I think is excessively conservative, but it's your choice. Um, and if you take that into account, it's clear our schools can actually be, we're gonna have potentially, um, I think I estimated we might be up to 1630, 1650 next year. I don't think that's outside the realm of possibility. So our schools are actually growing. As crazy as that seems, if you actually extrapolate the way that I do, we're actually gonna be much bigger. But the EPS formula, this is the part that I can't get past, and please help me find a way past. Uh, the EPS sheet in your binder, EPS teacher staffing, Go ahead and take a look at it. We have historically always had a particular student-teacher ratio. About two years ago, we deviated from that. I hear that we, 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 we're, we're leanly staffed, we, we have these, I, and I love the teachers, I don't want to fire anyone. It, I, I would love everything be done through absorbing retirements. We've deviated from our historic staffing levels. Unless I'm mistaken, we have a more, uh, we have higher, teacher to student ratio than at any point in the past. And Mr. Gross's point is the one I can't get past. And this sheet is the one I can't get past. We have, um, at the elementary school, we are very, very leanly staffed. We're in line with what we have always historically done, but that's not the case elsewhere. Help me understand why there isn't headcount to be reduced elsewhere, outside of Pond Cove. Well, um, do you all have the copy that Kathy put together showing the positions that, that have been added? Uh, you've got to be more specific. Out. Yep. It's handed out. Once it was, we're prior to the evening. The supplement's handed out at the beginning of the meeting. Yeah. It's um, one of two staffing changes over time, is what you're referring to. Do you have that? that? That might help answer your question. Okay. Ah. Ah. It, is that plan over time? Staffing changes over time? Yes. Staffing changes over time. You see that? Yep. So this may help. We um, started trying to put together some information um, to, to share with you about this very question that was raised. Yep. Enrollments are going down, staffing is going up. We wanted to do our best to try and show you what 
have been the hires over the last several years. Um, and so this is, this is the best we can come up with as of today. Um, and I think that what you're going to see is that we, um, I believe that when they went to the full day kindergarten, that we hired, I think, two or three additional teachers. And I don't know, other than in special education, that um, there have been many teachers hired that are your traditional classroom teacher. When, you th when I think about um, student-teacher ratio, I'm thinking of um, the physics teacher. How many students does the physics teacher have at, 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 uh, in a day, right? And then divide that, and, okay. So you can see here that, uh, I won't read it out loud, this is insulting, but a lot of the people that we've hired, I mean, one of them is we've gone from Believe it or not, last year we had a 25% position for gifted and talented for an entire school district. So that, this year we increased to one full-time position. That's one of them. But I wouldn't know how to, I mean, well, well that um, in, impacts the student-teacher class ratio, it really isn't a classroom teacher. And, yeah. and as you can see, the, the lion's share of these positions are supporting, it's just getting back to Heather's point, yeah. Yeah. they're supporting the classroom teacher. In, in most cases, they aren't, we aren't hiring um, more third grade teachers or seventh grade teachers or, yeah. Can I have a follow, follow up? Uh, so, um, Totally appreciate that, and that's where I disagree with Mr. Gross. Is the with the professional staffing, I'm just not as concerned. It's specifically with the teachers, as you noted, um, and I completely understand Heather's point and everyone's about the sports. Yeah. Totally understand. The issue is from the EPS perspective. We're at a 0.78 ratio at the high school. Our historic ratio was 0.88 to 0.9. We have approximately five teachers more on a student-teacher ratio than we historically did. And I, I, I don't want to cut people. I'd love to have it happen through attrition, but I want to know what changed. If our, if our high school was good enough two or three years ago, I'm not saying like slash the high school in any way, shape, or form. It's right. the, why can't we go back to where we were two years ago from a student-teacher ratio? So and, and tell me if I'm missing something. Oh, and, and I'm open to persuasion, okay. so. so uh, I'm talking to you. <laughs> Please. May, may I speak? Amen. So um, I would ask Mr. Shedd to um, help me answer this question. He spent some time earlier today looking at um, student-teacher class assignments. And um, would you mind sharing a summary of that, Mr. Shedd? Can I ask you to come up to the <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, would it be okay for him to speak? Yep. And could you come up to the podium? I'm not sure that I have the specific answer because my numbers, I was looking at something a little bit different. And um, I have to talk to Catherine Mesmer about what numbers are included because I can tell you over the last two years, we have not added any teachers. None. Zero. In fact, we have cut partial teachers. So I'm, I'm a little bit mystified as well. Our student population has gone down. Yeah, exactly. Next year is going back up. And we're absorbing that without any proposed increase in staff. In fact, we're proposing to decrease the staff next year. So there's some information I have to find out. But I can tell you what I, we have right now in the high school, we have 39.5 full-time equivalent classroom teachers. That's what we have. Um, we have, and my numbers, I was looking at students to teachers, um, and my numbers of students to teachers, so if you look at the number of students we have, and actually the number of students I was projecting in terms of what we're gonna have next year and staffing for next year, our student to teacher ratio will be 13.7 students to regular ed teacher. Um, in addition to those 39.5, regular ed classroom teachers, I can tell you that what we have in the high school, and you can stop me at any time if this is not responsive, please do. No, I, I, well, I might be the only person that loves this stuff, but. Um, no, okay, no, so, I oh, okay. Go. anybody stop me if this is, because I know it's not directly responsive to your question. I do have to look at the, um, so we have 39.5 classroom teachers. We have 19 regular educators who are not classroom teachers. 
um, that consists of it's a mix of administrators. There are three administrators, including the assistant principal, principal myself, guidance counselors, social workers, ed techs, the nurse, library, librarian, um, technology integrator. So there are a total of 19 people. So of the people who serve students in regular education, almost exactly two thirds of them are classroom teachers. Um, there are an addition in terms of the high school staff, there's an additional 13 special educators um, who are in the high school as well. Um, but in terms of, you know, our, our student numbers have gone down the last couple of years. Our reduction in teachers have, have, it has gone down, but it has not gone down quite proportionally because it doesn't really work that way when you try to organize classes. Um, and I'm happy to explain that in any, no, totally in any degree of detail, but it, it's, it's not a one-to-one -one formula, it just is not. Um, but we have not added, we have not added teachers in the last couple of years. So we have done some, some budget shifting of how we account for teachers, and I'm actually wondering, and I have to talk to Catherine Mesmer about whether that may be part of what you're seeing, and I just don't know enough to even guess about that right now, but I'm going to try to look at that tomorrow for sure. Other questions for Principal Shedd? Jessica? I've got a couple. Um, are there any classes in the high school where you have less, fewer than 10 students in a class? Yes. Um, so, the cl well, there's quite a few special education classes that we have that are fewer than 10. Okay. I, I really meant so regular, regular education. education. I meant regular. I'm sorry. Okay. Should have been clear about that. Yep. Regular education. Um, I think there's a list somewhere in the, in the binder I gave to the school board anyway. I'm not sure if the town council has yeah. it. But there Last is, page in the high school tab. Is, is it there? Yes, it is. Yes. I don't have I that it. specifically in front of me. Um, there's a class called Art Studio, mm -hmm. uh, which is our most our class for our most advanced art students. Um, these are students who have essentially maxed out on our, our art offerings. Mm -hmm. So every now and so I think that class is nine instead of ten, which is mm -hmm. what we look at as a minimum. Um, there are um, a couple of, most of the classes that we have that are fewer than 10 are because there are students in them who require some additional support and time and attention. Um, and that's true, we have a pre-algebra class that we added midway through the year that has, I believe, nine students. Uh, we have a physical science class that I'm pretty sure has a little bit fewer than nine students, although it may, it's grown over the course of the year, so by now it may have a couple more. We don't have many, uh, but we do have some. In most, and in almost every case, they are either classes that are, oh, thank you. Oh, that makes it so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a section of World History II, which is fewer than nine students. It's a class that's specifically put together for students who need some more time and support. There's an AP macroeconomics class that has, I think, nine students. When we scheduled it in the master schedule, I think there were 13 or 14 who were signed up, or frankly, we wouldn't have run it. Uh, but in the course of ad drop period and things like that, it dropped down to about nine. We have, in terms of fewer than nine, we have one photography class um, that has fewer than nine, but the other one, when you look at the average, they average more than, more than 10, and that is actually an aberration historically, and that will not be the case next year. We have a public speaking class that right now I think has nine students, and in the beginning, that's another one, in the beginning of the year it had, I think, 13, and there were a few students who either couldn't fit into their schedule or had to drop it. Um, but so those are, classes that are fewer than 10 students. It's very, very, very uncommon. Okay. Jessica, and can I interrupt for a follow-up? I just, sure. you, you were mentioning a couple of classes that it sounded like maybe um, the, the creation of the class is to, su is to support lower performing students, is that right? And I assume then that that's partially driven by the proficiency-based diplomas or not? Uh, it would, to some extent, to the... Uh, Pre-algebra, for example. Well, the algebra one definitely is connected to that um, because that's a freshman class 
and those are the students who are on, who can only graduate according to state law by, by proficiency in three years. So that one specifically was connected to it. Um, I'm, I, I wouldn't be able to stand here and say the other ones specifically were, uh, but, there are, but most of the classes, it is because either the classes started off at more than 10 and over the course it, they dropped, so we have to look at those, or they are classes that have been deliberately created either for students who are in mainstream classes but who need extra support, um, and so we deliberately create a few classes in a few very specific instances to address the needs of those students. Thanks, Jessica. Yep, I have another question, and this is on the enrollment history plus FY 1819 projection. Um, I was wondering about the uh, the numbers from from uh, eighth grade to ninth, and then also the subsequent high school uh, enrollment numbers for projection 1819, and. Um, so it looks like there's usually a variety between eighth grade and ninth grade, and it seems that most of the time, or at least over half, you, you lose because students, students will go to a different high school, private high school exactly. or something. Exactly. And so it looks like, though, from this year to next, you're projecting the exact same number. You've got 149 in eighth grade this year, and you're projecting 149 in ninth grade next year. And then it looks like all the numbers from 18 to 19 slide over. So you've got, uh, you know, there's no variation is what I'm getting at. You have 134 to 134, 125 to 125, 145 to 145 as each grade advances the next year, you've got the exact same number of students sliding in, and that's not a pattern anywhere else. And you're in this, you know, since fiscal year eight, nine. So do you, surely there, if, you know, well, let me ask you this. If you have students that are not coming back in ninth grade, do you not know by now? Or, I mean, because there's, as I say, historically there's, you know, so historically we lose between six and eight or nine per year. I'm get, what I've estimated in terms of my planning um, is if this year's eighth grade class, as you say, is 149, yeah. I would guess that the, the numbers I've been working with for my planning are 140 for next year. Um, and that's what I base that calculation on. And that's pretty much what I do every year, Jessica. Um, yeah. so, so I can't answer for this specific document, but that's that's because the it, number. Yeah, so you're saying yep. you, you would calculate 140, but this says 149. Yes. Yeah, I would say that I think that we're going to be a little bit lower than that. Okay. But also, um, it, there are a couple times that, that families will uh, um, uh, plan on moving their, their, their family from one, from one community, one school to another, and that eighth grade to ninth grade is one of those times. So I would say that I don't know what the history is, but our secretaries, I know, would know the answer to this. There are some number of children that we, every year, have coming in um, for, for, for say, say, for ninth grade that were moved in historically over the summer. So I'm, if you're at 140 with current cl class, it's gonna probably be a higher number when school actually begins because families move in to have their children begin and have a full high school experience. I would agree with everything the superintendent says, and thank you for inviting me up here, by the way. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> You're doing a great job. I, I, think, I think a safe bet is we're going to be somewhere in the low to mid 140s. That's where I suspect that we will be. Um, but Howard, the superintendent is actually right. We could get back up to 149. We will definitely have six to 10 students leave, and we will probably have a, a handful of students come as well. So and we do not have all that information right, right. now. Jessica, yeah. I, I, I just wanted to ask another clarifying question for your numbers. So you were asking, if, if I heard you correctly, you were asking why there was the continuity of the numbers from the previous budget year forward as yeah, part of the projection when that numbers, wasn't the yeah. case in the yeah. historical, but the historical numbers are all actuals, not right. projections. Right, right. So 
Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure that I understand the comparison. Well, it just, it, I, I thought there would be a change, I certainly thought there'd be a change from eight to nine, even, even in advance. Yeah, this, I'm sorry. It shows the trend, but I mean, I've, there's a change between eight and nine usually, and there, you know, and this one was the exact same number, and I thought, well, that just doesn't seem to be I, can I can I answer this question? Hold, hold on okay. one second, right. Caitlin. I was just going to say, from what I'm hearing, we're saying that we're going to lose some and gain some. So, right. making a yeah. projection, we're just going with the rounded number. Right. If you want to make the argument that. The, art, the numbers are just slid, then we need to look at the last few budget books and see if they did the number yeah, slide or if they did, say, or if they the did an actual projection, right. because then you can have the argument that you're having. But right now, right. they just projected because that's the best they can project. Mm -hmm. But if you notice, the number did change from kindergarten to first grade. He <laughs> added six. So <laughs> there was one at least changed. I can directly answer the question if it's helpful. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, so John Volz made this point as part of his budget presentation. If you go back and watch the school board presentation, what he said is he did, went back and did an analysis, and I apologize if I get this wrong, of all the prior years and the estimates um, in prior times, how good were they at estimating? And what he concluded is that no matter whether you estimate up or you estimate down, you always get it wrong. And, and you're better off just sticking with the numbers from the prior year rather That's than right. trying to do the estimates. So. In almost every year for the last six years, the prior year's total enrollment number was a better estimate than the estimate that they came up with. If you go back and compare act, forecast to actual for several years running. It was certainly true when I ran for school board and it's been true ever since. Go ahead, Jessica. Um, I was also looking at the, the school board's uh, Projections, 2014-15, you hired planning decisions to project enrollment. Um, this is a document that's in the Comprehensive Plan Committee uh, resource documents, so it's been looked at there. And I was wondering if you could comment about that, because um, <clears throat> they project through to fiscal year 2025, and it, it does show a, a drop. And so I, you know, I don't know how you, I don't know if, John, if you reviewed those I, figures as well and... Yes. I, 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 go ahead, Howard. Um, no, I can't, I can't answer the question. I have studied the chart. I have little confidence in those studies, to, tell, to be quite candid. Uh, I have a lot more confidence in taking current numbers of students and rolling them over one year. I've had much more success with that than uh, people coming in studying birth rates and homes for sale and age of community. Um, it, it just, uh, it's, it's a, way, uh, a way to make a living, but I, I don't know about the validity of it. Um, I, you know, if we were to really look at the difference of the incoming class for the freshmen being somewhere between 140 and 149, let's just pretend that was the, the swing there of nine students, I would say that having been a high school principal, it would have no bearing on my staffing for my incoming freshmen, none. Even nine students off. I still would need the teachers I have for the 149 for 140. Am, am, am I right, right, Mr. Shedd? Right, I mean, it just... John? I, I can speak specifically to looking at the, the, the forecasts that were done before. Um, part of what drove, drove me to go look at the, what was the actuals to forecast analysis was the uh, um, concerning inaccuracies of, the, of those forecasts. In fact, those, a lot of those ones were done at a time where your base year was a, was a major recession year, so that all the trends were pointing down and no way you would adjust the data would ever get them going in the direction that they actually went. And so all of the forecasts were boat anchored by this outlier data point and were, were often inaccurate, which is why the prior year's estimate was much better than any of the previous estimates. Right. And, so, and that happened year after year after year after year. And so, like I said, I, you know, I, I, you know, I think you can come up with a more sophisticated uh, analysis that does look at year by year and what you add and what you subtract, but it looks nothing like this and we haven't done the work and this is pretty close. I mean, if I guessed 1,600 last year and right now we're at 1,599, I'd be pretty happy with my estimate. Chris? Uh, so, uh, 
Just want to echo exactly what John Volt said. He hit the nail on the head there. Perfect explanation. Uh, I'd simply just note with the comprehensive plan, as you guys know, I've had issues with, the, with uh, that uh, statistical data. There's two sources for our population data. There's the actual US Census, where they go out and count people's heads. That's stuff you can use. Then there's what's known as the American Community Survey, which are these rough estimates. You can't use those for yearly, people do it, you can't use those for yearly predictions as to what the actual population is, that snapshot in time. It's actually a five your average guesstimate. And just to get to the, val the validity of that data, if the comprehensive plan is using data from, I think it was like 2016, it's not looking at the newest data. The newest data that just came out, and this shows how unreasonable and how inaccurate this is, why it shouldn't be used, it says that the population under five has grown something like 30 or 40% in one year. So it also says that our town is getting significantly younger and that the population over 55 is shrinking. I don't think that's accurate, but that's what it says, and that's why you can't use that data. Uh, but I, I'm getting too far afield. What I did want to focus on is that I did take those projections. I applied what I thought was a reasonable growth rate across them, and I looked out to 2024. And when I do that, and I basically take the grades and roll them through, what I see is by 2024, based on our student load, I would expect us to absorb through attrition something, along five, something around five headcount uh, from the high school. I'm sorry, what was that? Five head count by 2024. So that's obviously, this is me attempting to do that five year plan out. So what I see in order to get us to what Bill Gross is pointing to from a teacher, I'm not looking at all the, just from the teacher count, I want to, I anticipate, and obviously this is, we're reading tea leaves, we can't actually say what the population is going to be. If we can have a plan that has us absorb that much headcount, it brings us into alignment with our historic staffing levels. So what I want to see is some plan, and I think you guys have made great progress by absorbing the two headcount this year, but I want to know what's the plan for next year, and to bring this back to my questions earlier, and how are we going to deal with the young designated fund? We pulled 800, uh, the proposal was 800,000 last year, we used 400,000 this year, uh, I think is the pros. There's not going to be that rainy day fund to pull from, and we're going to have to make really hard decisions again next year. Next year. I totally hear what John Voltz is saying, that these cuts from the state have to end eventually because there's nothing left to cut. So we won't have this yearly growth, but we also aren't going to have that rainy day fund. So do we have any plan for next year when this happens? Who are you directing questions? I don't know. <laughs> to, to everyone. This is me just bemoaning the situation, so I apologize if it's not productive. John? So I, I'm probably not going to be here, but, <laughs> but have we certainly thought about it? Yes. Like we said before, this is more than a one-year problem. And I think that there's a, a, a lot of things that we'll look at, but I think that that's, that's part and parcel of what you sit down with and talk about when you have your new superintendent coming in, is what does that long-range planning look like? And, what is, and what's, the, what's the approach to it. The other thing I would say is I wouldn't do anything on the EPS side until I knew exactly how, what the, what's really in those counts. Because we did this before where we thought, well, we should really count the revenues on a gross basis, not a net basis, and it turned out, oops, the state holds that against you, yeah. and we changed it back. Because it was actually, it was, it, 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 you know, it was more transparent from the accounting, but it ended up hurting us on the state funding, so we changed it back. And we may have done something similar on the, on the way those state numbers, the teacher numbers, are based on what, what Jeff is saying in terms of what the actual teacher count that he's aware of is. I don't know if we've got to be able to go back and look and say, what's apples to apples? So that may be an artifact that we can fix in the funding formula, and there may not have been a change in the actual personnel. There may have been a change in how we're counting for those personnel, and, and, and or the state may have changed how they're counting in personnel and not really, it may not have been transparent to us. Those are the kind of changes, m minor changes that happen in the funding formula all the time, and you're not aware of them until it's too late because your data is old. So people who are changing the data can see what's coming down the pike, and you can't, because your, your data is already two years old. Um, I want to jump in. I want to make a comment, because there's been a lot of discussion back and forth about the funding formula. Um, at one of your meetings um, that I attended, uh, Senator Millette was there, and I think she had been invited specifically for the purpose of explaining to the board and the public what the funding formula was, how it worked. I think there was some ambiguity on, you know, parts of many as to exactly how that worked. And the, the one thing I thought was interesting, and I just share for the council if you didn't either watch the meeting or weren't there, is 
the formula, whether, whether towns like Cape Elizabeth like the outcome or not, um, and regardless of the, whichever criteria are being used on a yearly basis, is designed to dispassionately and objectively come up with what the state thinks the town should be able to bear. Um, it is not that it's a person or a group of people of one political ideology or another that are sitting in a room saying, oh, well, let's, you know, screw the people of Cape Elizabeth or whatever, <laughs> um, as much as it might seem like that sometimes. Um, but basically, it, this formula spits out, this is what we think Cape Elizabeth or any other individual town should be able to bear based on the data that, that, and, and variables that go into the formula. Um, so you come out on the other side of that saying, okay, well, based on that revenue contribution, the, the, you know, the town basically gets put in the decision, obviously, of having to say, okay, well, we either support that or we don't. I mean, I, I think it, it fundamentally comes down to as simple an equation as that. Again, we might not like the outcome, we might not like the product of the, of the process, but that, that's the decision that gets you know, put in our laps to decide on behalf of the citizens of the town. So anyway, I just wanted to speak specifically to that. So um, Penny, go ahead. No Jessica? Yeah, I, I watched the video. I thought um, that Senator Millette gave a very um, uh, a very good explanation of, of the formula. I mean, I'm very familiar with it because I've been on the council for a while, but I thought she did a very good job of laying it out there and how it's developed and so forth. Um, I, I want to say just, I've got a brief question for the, for the superintendent. Um, and I'm very aware of the mandated expenses we have. Uh, I, I do know we have far more staff than the state feels we need to have. have. I have those documents there. The, the, uh, what's the number? Seven, 279 shows all that, and that's Cape Elizabeth's choice. Um, you, we have our collective bargaining agreements, and I, the, you know, the school board continually says that they have no control over that. I, I would take some issue with that. You, you do negotiate those, so you have you have control. You negotiate them. Yeah. And I thought I was very glad to hear Senator Millette admit something that I was here on the council when it occurred, but many people forget, which was the school. Uh, uh, Salaries and benefits were buoyed significantly by the uh, a, a recover, Obama's Recovery Act. I think Cape Elizabeth got over $2 million over a several year period. Um, school districts across the country did, and which allowed, uh, it helped prevent the teachers from feeling the, the brunt of the recession that most others felt. So they've, they had that buoy maneuver in, um, in the recession that others did not. And I, I was glad that she mentioned that because I certainly remember that. And at, at the same time, we were at sometimes 0% for our, on the municipal side, whereas the, the school department was giving raises to their teachers and because they got this federal money to do that. Um, I wonder, I still think that Mr. Gross had superb points. I think staffing is an issue, and this is what you can control. You know, once you've set your collective bargaining agreement, well, you've got that for three years, or whatever your term is, but you, you can control the number of staff you have. And, you know, as I point out, since our peak of 2006, we are down 248 students, and I just can't get beyond that. I do want to ask a specific question, though, back to my concern about mandated things that we have to do. I, I was told by a neighbor that kindergarten students are learning Spanish. Is that correct? Or do kindergarten and well, low yeah. elementary have foreign language? I, I just was curious. Uh, Go ahead, Aaron. Uh, Jason, sure. you answer that? Please. <laughs> You're next, Troy. Yeah, it's your turn. Troy, <laughs> get ready. <laughs> yeah, he's the new Pineville principal. Thanks, Mr. Good Mayor. evening. Yes, kindergarten students do not they receive don't? foreign language. Okay. Do elementary students receive foreign language? Starts in first grade. Starts at first grade. Is this mandated by the state? No, I do not believe so, no. Okay. So this is an example then. I mean, I think it's delightful. However, this would be an example 
to me, of something that is not mandated, not required, very nice to have, but, you know, could we live without? I mean, I'm just asking the question because if we are considering staff student uh, student to teacher ratios, which, by the way, the the, the school uh, I recall the school department changed this class policy. I believe it was 2015 to. Uh, for smaller classes. And this could have, and I believe it was a factor in our school funding uh, situation because they do take into consideration parent, I'm um, sorry, student and uh, to teacher, teacher to student ratio. So I, I wanted to ask because again, a neighbor said, oh my gosh, my kindergarten is learning Spanish and that's very nice, but of course she was wrong. <laughs> So maybe it was a first grader, but I just wanted to know, is that mandated? Is that a nice to have that we're giving? This, which it sounds like it is. Howard? Um, this is a, a good question. My impression though, is that um, world language is one of the proficiencies that's required in order to graduate. Um, and we don't teach world language at elementary five days a week, correct? For the youngest children. It's several days. Cor correct. Right. One, once every six days. In right. Month, so. so it's very infrequent. Um, I would say, and Sonia, you'll be next, please, uh, <laughs> with permission. Uh, we, uh, m m my impression it, 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 uh, is that students learn a second or third language best when they're young. And learning the language is doing more than helping them learn the language. It's helping them learn to listen and to, uh, well, this is where, could we have Sonia speak to this? <laughs> Sonia, I'm sorry. But, yeah. Could you articulate on this, please? I mean, I mean, this is part of why we do these things, because it's more than what might meet the, uh, the, the eye. So would you mind talking about the benefit of language at a young age? Well, I would like to address first a comment uh, you made. Um, Mrs. Salaman about um, is foreign language necessary in first grade. I remember that under Superintendent Nadeau, uh, the whole community, not just teachers, but the whole community gathered in the cafeteria. And it was the community that uh, asked to have foreign language started actually in kindergarten. And that's when there was that shift to go, because it's the program, I think, back, back then, uh, foreign language started in third grade, uh, to go down to first grade. Now, I don't have the schedule of the first grade teachers, but as um, the uh, principal of the elementary school said, the, the, the students don't see the teachers every day. Now, as a um, person who was born and raised uh, in France, from parents who were born and raised in Spain, I can certainly tell you that uh, children learn a foreign language much easily uh, the younger they are because they don't have the concept of making mistakes. So they're like sponges, they absorb, they absorb phrases um, and they will very quickly reciprocate what they hear by uh, hearing the language. So by um, starting a language program very early on, you actually uh, help them to become more proficient and less, I would say, paralyzed by making mistakes. Because we adults, when we start to learn a foreign language, unless we know we're going to nail that sentence, we're not going to say it. And uh, younger students don't have that concept, actually. Um, and the, the, the foreign language program since I've been teaching in Elizabeth since 1995 is actually probably a very strong, I would say, one of our strongest department uh, because the curriculum since I was uh, in Cape Elizabeth has been always articulated from the elementary school to the high school. We work vertically. Uh, back then when we, we used to, um, to buy books, uh, we would meet all together, teachers from the elementary school, middle school, and high school to agree on the books that uh, we, um, we would purchase. Um, also, every year, uh, teachers from the high school go to the middle school to interview the uh, eighth grader for the placement into ninth grade. We help teachers at the middle school correct the copies, so we're very much in involved with the placement. Uh, and I think it's this collaboration that makes our department very strong, but also the fact that because we start so early, we are able to teach a level six in high school. And I don't know a lot of high schools uh, in, uh, in Maine and even in the US, I will challenge that, that offer a level six course. Um, in level six, for example, in Spanish, which is a class that I teach, 
Um, I teach and teach about the Spanish Civil War because on, in my family side, um, many people were very involved. And I teach a play, so students are reading an entire book in the native language, and they're able to do that because those students started very early on. Um, they're also able to do, at the, when they exit high school, a 30-minute exit interview that uh, we started a few years ago thanks to uh, a fund from CIF to train us as teachers to do this type of interview. And they're able to uh, conduct a conversation with us. It's a one-on-one -on -one conversation, uh, 30 minutes in that native language. And when we interview students who come from another district and say, you know, I've been taking French or Spanish and I'm in level three, and we have this interview to see if they really can produce, they cannot really carry on a conversation for a long time, and our students can do that. Also, our students who graduate from uh, Cape Elizabeth High School, when they take a placement test in college, most likely they will bump, be bumped to a level two or even sometime a level three. We've seen that. Uh, the result we have, for example, for the Spanish AP exam are really high because we start very young. So I think we have to be very careful because it takes a lot of years to build a very strong program like this. And if we start to say, well, let's reduce you know, the exposure to foreign language in third grade and then maybe in fourth grade, you can really undermine an entire program that took so many years to build. And then it takes so much more time to put it back where it was. Thank you. Um, Valerie? Uh, Thank you. I'm a huge proponent of foreign languages in schools, but to respond to the sort of larger point, we could go through all of these different positions and say, do we really need this one and do we really need that one and can't we cut this or can't we cut that? But to bring it back to what Jamie said, this is our decision as a community whether we want to pay for this or not. And although we're being asked by the state to pay more, to bear more of the cost, the concept is that we are contributing the same percentage of our income so that those people who are making less contribute a similar percentage of income towards the education. So, I mean, this isn't, I, I have certain issues with certain other things, not with staffing, but I was just hoping we could maybe shift the conversation away from staffing since we're getting into those more specific items and talk about some other stuff. Is everyone, is everyone okay with that? By all means. Um, I just wanted to ask a few questions and now I'm gonna go through and do the nitpicking thing, but <laughs> um, I noticed on page 53 of the budget highlights um, at the very bottom, there is a note about um, the computer lease for the first year of a three-year lease on iPad Airs. And it seems like we're paying an awful lot of money for the iPad <coughs> Airs for, that are leased. And I know there was a recent news story about how a lot of schools are paying more than they should. Is there, is there any way that we could get a better deal on these iPad Airs? Should we be, if we, it seems like if we buy them, even if we buy them with a keyboard, for all of the incoming freshmen that we would be paying less than with this three-year lease. Um, so that was the first point. And then in that same, there the last three items. Um, I was hoping to hear more about the six classrooms that need short throw projectors and sound systems and the new Wi-Fi system and how necessary those are. Go ahead. Uh, Noel, who is our special uh, our director for technology, is not here this evening, and he is going to be more articulate by a long shot than I am in answering any of this. What um, I could try to have him here tomorrow night to, to try and, and, and answer these, uh, if you don't, wouldn't mind waiting until tomorrow night. But I, I would just say this: we recognize that. Um, the computers are expensive, and, and, and as you know well, they're, they're used today as a, an educational learning tool. I mean, it's just, uh, that's what students and teachers are using all the time. We are, next year, we had a meeting recently of the administration and agreed that we were gonna try and pilot 
some alternative um, computers. I think one of them might be called Chrome, um, which we've heard good things about, and we want to try and have a group of teachers and administrators take that on for the year and then report back to everybody else how did it go, what, what did they like, and notice about them. And, but um, we are intentionally trying to look for alternatives to I mean, people right now. There's a pretty s smooth move on Apple's part to come into Maine, and um, I mean, once you get used to driving a Chevy, you kind of like Chevys, and you, and that's I think what's what happened with we we all really like Apple because that's what we've been using for a long time now. But we realized that there are other ways to go that might be not as expensive and would meet our needs. Um, so. We, we, we are actively pursuing alternatives right now. I just want you to know that. Um, I, can't, I, um, I can't speak to the details. You mentioned about the classroom speakers. and I, I, Does anybody here, can yeah. anybody of our... I can uh, address one of them because I, I went to one meeting, uh, <laughs> technical meeting. Uh, accessibility to Wi-Fi is a certain part of the building. Just, there's no access to it whatsoever. And even Wi-Fi is technology you have to change as well. I'm trying to look here, what was it, page 51, you said? Uh, 53. So, 53, okay. What is the total lease and, uh, because typically what, we know that commercial ones, iPad costs 600, 700 at least. So I just wanted to know what it is, so you can do the lease comparison right, right away, right now. So um, it's, it looks like a, an iPad Air 3 is about two or three hundred dollars. That's right, that's right. So the, and purchasing is about 700 bucks. Uh, that we can purchase on retail store, so maybe that's the benefit. Uh, insurance, but again, no one's probably the best person to answer that question. Um, I, I can attempt to answer it somewhat because both Kimberly and I were on the um, technology steering committee last year with Noel, and uh, as I recall, um, the leasing program. The benefit of that is you're you're, you're essentially owning it because at the end of your leasing period, you get to keep that. You don't give it up and trade up for a new one. You get to keep it and pass it on to younger grades. So while there is an increased, a slight increase of outright purchase of your own, there is a benefit to the leasing program, which allows you to, after, after I forget if it's two years, it's yours, even though you've been leasing it, it's yours. And you're able to hand that down to younger grades as needed. So there's a, there is a cost benefit to the leasing system over just outright purchase, which, as you know, these, these devices don't last forever, you know, and they're outdated quickly. So that's, that's my recollection of the, um, the decision making for that. Maybe we could get this question, these questions to Noel yeah. for our answer to um, I guess one, can I Go ahead. Get one follow up question. Um, has any thought been given to maybe having um, parents provide these items or students provide them on their own and maybe having a program for families that can't afford that to apply for assistance? Go ahead, Howard. Um, yes, we have talked about that. We've talked about it at the board level and we've talked about it at the administrative level. And we know, for example, that Falmouth does that very thing, um, at least for high school. I don't know about the, about the middle and elementary, but um, the idea is just what you said, that it, uh, parents provide their children's com um, computers and then those that are not able to afford one, the school um, provides a, a, a loan, so to speak. I, mean, I think that what Noel would say to you, um, and we find to be compelling, is that one of the problems with that is that you've got then um, a real range of computers that are in a building uh, in terms of, of managing that and working on them. Um, and that's a problem for his staff, is to, to have that many different kinds of computers um, being, being used. Um, I'm not saying it's insurmountable, I'm just saying to him it was very unappealing. And the issue also was that it is embarrassing for some children to be uh, not able to bring their own while the vast majority of their peers have that at home. That was awkward. And I think another is that, was that why would we do this when we, I mean, if we really do believe that computers are an essential educational tool, why would we then say to the parents, by the way, you need to provide that for your child, rather than just saying, you know what, this is part of what we provide you as a student in our schools. We give you the tool that you need to, to get your education. 
I think, I think those are some of his main arguments. But I guess, you know, the, the calculator, for example, the TI-84 plus or whatever, that's a that's hundred and some odd dollars. It's, you can get a very cheap version, a very pared down older version of an iPad Air for about $150. So mm -hmm. it's not that big. And, and what I wasn't proposing is that the, that the students who can't afford them have to borrow them, but that maybe there's a program with a fund for them. Okay. But, yep. but I do understand that they, yep. that is a, not a good situation when, right. okay. to put students in. Yeah. Heather? Can I add one memory that I have from that discussion? Um, was also the teachers explaining that having multiple different types of devices and systems, am I correct in yep. remembering that the was very difficult, and that streamlining and having one, um, one type of device was going to make the classroom much more efficient and effective. Caitlin? I was just going to equate it to, it's no different than a textbook, correct? Like, right. you know, when I was in high school, we were given a textbook when we got to U.S. history. Now, everything can be done on the iPad. So, right. it's no different than years ago, budgets included a textbook for geometry, a textbook for, like, the schools provided all of those textbooks. It's not till college that you have to buy them yourself. <laughs> but so it's the same thing. We are providing a textbook, basically, in this iPad, correct? I'm, yeah. And I, right, so it's, you know, it's very similar. Right. Yeah, I have a comment here. Uh, from an IT perspective, working in the IT uh, field, uh, as uh, Howard alluded to it, is basically, even if you have identical iPads, you still have an issue with configuration, and as soon as you plug in the iPad in the network, we are all prone to viruses. So the virus is the most difficult one to, to control. And if it's your personal computer, then the school has no authority to change your password, to put what to put in there, and so forth. Um, so the best way for the school to purchase it and for the students to lease it on a monthly basis or yearly basis, and that's the only way to do it. Property physically have to belong to the school. Has there ever been any discussion or consideration of a technology fee, mm -hmm. much like we have an activity fee or other things? Is there any? Has, has that ever been explored? And again, similarly, you could have, right. uh, you know, subsidy for based on need or something like that. But right. I'm not aware that we've had that. I don't remember having that conversation. But it's an interesting point. I mean. People do that sometimes with, with labs or with athletics, or I mean, there are a number of examples of where that happens. We're required to purchase our own insurance. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It's optional, but. No, you're required. Pretty much. Yeah. I thought it was optional. No. It, you're just responsible for the replacement cost if you don't buy it. That's all. That's that's how I understood it. I think so. So I just wanted to. And these have been ongoing conversations about technology and technology costs. There, are, everything you mentioned, I think, has been considered. Uh, well, what I would pass along is that making those technology changes is not something that is straightforward or fast or easy, and particularly because there has already been significant investment by many of the staff in terms of getting their curriculum aligned with the technology that's available and making a platform shift or making other things uh, is, is a lot more than just the boxes. Um, it, it's a big investment. Just like when you invest in, like Caitlin said, when you invest in a textbook and you build all your lesson plans around the textbook, changing textbooks is a big deal then. Uh, and so, um, you know, with what Mohammed has said, there's all these issues around uh, control and access and curriculum. Build. But all of these things have, are, have, have been and are in active discussion. The technology fee piece is somewhat, is is new to the discussion. I don't think that that's something that's been considered. But as I said, they've certainly looked at uh, both different devices, different platforms, uh, cost savings, bring your own. All of those have been on the table for discussion. I think um, as I think broadly about some of the dynamics of the discussion going on in the community right now, um, there are certain aspects of the education that we provide that are sort of fundamental, right? And and whether you have kids in the school or not, um, you know, it's part of the fabric of the community. And, you know, we all 
in, in some direct or indirect way reap benefit from having strong schools and all that kind of stuff. I, I, look at, I start to look at things like this item and um, others like it and question whether or not there should be a little extra burden on the actual users versus the community writ large. So that would be something, whether for this budget cycle or for um, future years, I think is worth further delving into in terms of um, the things that are deemed to be n not, not programs like Spanish or things like that, but um, things like the technology choices we're making and things like that that are, are um, truly born by the user or, or their families versus necessarily the entire community. I think that's worth exploring a little bit more. But, Susanna? Um, I, I just want to say that uh, it, it seems like this is a, a good point to, um, to say how education has evolved over time. And we are now um, you know, in, a, in a global marketplace. And we have to make choices. And, and there, are, there are facts out there, like technology, like the need for multiple languages. Um, some may not be mandated, but we, we are in a different world than we were before, and we as a community have to choose how we want to best prepare our students for the future. And I, I agree with your point, and I think it's a valid thing to consider um, going down the road, but at, at, what, at what point you know, do we separate out what the student or the user should bear versus what we, we should give, what we should provide. So I'm just yeah. making a I, I agree. I, th I think even in some of the communication we're getting from people that are advocating support of the budget, you, you hear a lot of, I'd be willing to you know, incur this extra increase, this extra burden, because I value this. And I, I think if you play that same philosophy through, then there, it's, a, it's a fairly straight line to people potentially being willing to do more of that if, if it meant um, garnering wider support for some of the more fundamental aspects of, of programming and education. So that that's the sort of broad point. Just Go ahead. Add on to that quickly. Going back, <laughs> back to, to you. To Penny's original point about like looking at this differently and, and you know trying to pre prepare for um, the future. This is part of that. Mm -hmm. You know, it requires creativity. It requires us all working together. For years, the school has felt alone, you know, in trying to solve this massive, you know, conundrum. But, but really, we need to approach it together. Whether it's some parents say, you know, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll cover this fund. Or, or the, the town comes together and say, we'll cover this fund. Or, or I guess my point is, is there's a lot of ways to solve our, our problem. And... Um, that's what I'd like to point out. Um, Penny, and before you start talking, so I, I, I'm respectful of the request that was made um, at the outset tonight, and I see that we're about five minutes before 9.30, so um, I don't want to push us too much longer, but um, go ahead. I'll be short. Susanna, I, I agree with you a thousand percent that our obligation is to prepare our young people for a global economy. And it, it's, we have to do that. Um, but before you said that, I was going to go to, um, in any organization that is large, and don't take this wrong, uh, bureaucratic. And because the larger something is, the more bureaucracy is created. And within that bureaucracy are many smart, bright people. And they're all working really hard. My question is, um, is there, are there any mechanisms in place within the schools that uh, allows, encourages, um, tries to garner improvements and cost reductions? because we've all worked in corporate America, or many of us have, and that's what we do when we have to cut. And we go to the people who are on the floor day in and day out and go, you know, this is a, 
you know, if we did this, we could save this. And so are there programs within our schools that are, are doing that so that we can leverage the knowledge and expertise of the people who do the work every day? I don't. Uh, I'm not aware of any um, large scale plan to promote that kind of questioning. I, 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 I can think of examples where people have informally come to me or a building level administrator or a central office administrator and said, you know what, why do we do this or have you thought about that? Um, it, it happens, I would say happenstance. It is not by something that we, uh, I'm aware of this in our culture that we're constantly asking ourselves, where can we um, save money? I think we ask ourselves, what can we do um, to better educate the children. I think with that, something we always are asking ourselves and asking each other and talking about that on the educational side, but I, I, I'm not aware that it's ingrained in our culture that we're talking about how to uh, pair, pair the cost. Uh, I, that may not be impressive, but it, it's an honest answer. Sarah? Um, I have a couple things. First of all, I think it's really, um, in dangerous territory to compare a school to a corporation or business because they're completely different. A corporation has people who, who purchase things and therefore you have a revenue stream and unfortunately a school and most educational institutions, maybe you could say colleges are different, aren't corporations or businesses. They have to have a completely different model. Although I agree with your premise that there should we should look at efficiencies and therefore I was going to suggest maybe it would be really helpful and instructive if we form like a strategic planning committee made up of, you know, a school board member, three citizens, you know, a couple administrators, whatever. Because I'm finding on the comprehensive plan that it's really interesting and productive to be, force yourself to look 15, 20 years down the road and say, what do we think our challenges will be? How are we going to address them? What do we have now? It's a different way of thinking than the regular board work where you're putting out fires each meeting. So I'm just throwing that out there as an idea. I mean, it would be like a comp plan, only it would be for spending, and we could look across all. And it wouldn't be specifically like spending, how do we reduce costs, but more big picture, like where do we want to head? How can we strategically get there while we bring taxpayers along? And because I think everyone at the table is essentially saying the same thing, which is, this year's really tough, but, w but we need to think about five years, 10 years. And I think a lot of citizens really are asking the same question. So I'm just throwing that there as idea. And I just wanted to finish by saying I fully support Elizabeth's proposal that we end at 9.30 since we'll all be back here <laughs> next <laughs> tomorrow at 7. <laughs> Susanna. I just, I just want to uh, say, Sarah, that I think, I think that's an excellent idea. Because given, given everything on all the teachers' plates, given everything on the uh, administrators' plate, given everything on the superintendent's plate, given everything on our plate, there is like no, hardly any room, any bandwidth, as I said earlier, to focus on something as progressive as that and as important. I, I, I think, you know, getting input, getting, forming this new kind of committee is an excellent idea. John. So just briefly, I would echo that 100%. I think both, the, the, I would say certainly the school, and I would suggest the town as well, ought to have a formal mechanism to have a view five and 20 years out. And, and I would say that from the school board side, that's not just a, uh, an expense and facilities type of thing, it's also a revenue thing. I think that if we put it into our long range plans, we could have an awesome Cape Elizabeth Alumni Association, which could help ameliorate some of this, but that doesn't happen overnight. That takes some long-term planning and engagement with our alumni, but those are the kinds of things that happen when you're able to look out on a longer-term plan. Same thing if you can really address what does a technology fee plan look like, who's doing it well, what does it look like, how do we manage some of these costs, and where are we seeing um, the big impacts that we can learn from others on, as well as, same, long-term plan. How do we deal with state funding? So if we got just the average that we've been getting for the last 10 years, we'd be a budget cut. <laughs> we'd be a tax benefit to everybody. That would have been $2.4 million, we're getting 1.2. So our budget increase was $800,000, $700,000. The state funding would have been 1.3 million more than it would have been, just average. We don't need more, we need to average. 
this year. Okay, uh, time is short, and I will leave my analogy for another night, or just tell uh, pity uh, about it. This is a response to her. But I want to humbly, humbly request of you, Jamie, to please do not have Mr. and Mrs. Straw show for the next one. <laughs> I humbly request that. I have two options for you. If you do that again, I'm going to come half hour late, half hours to take it. Or I'm going to boycott this. And if he leaves, I'm going to leave as well. I humbly request that it do let us know if it's going to be discussed, then I will come late. So, first of all, uh, I want to say that it is a matter that is, was absolutely necessary for us to resolve, number well, one. Second time, and, yeah. And number two, I did provide the courtesy of a heads up to this, uh, your chair to let her know that it was something that was going to be taken up tonight. So, um, I, I appreciate where you're coming from, from the standpoint of the efficiency of the meeting, but I also don't, I don't appreciate the notion that it was in any way um, if there's no legal intended barrier, to be, there's nothing to let argue. me finish, let me finish, it, in any way intended to be disrespectful of you all and your time, or to diminish the importance of um, settling the issue. So it went unsettled at our last meeting, it was brought back up in the interest settled. of settling it, so um, that's what we did here. Right, I'll show up on time. Next um, time. <laughs> I apologize, Nasser, because Jamie did tell me today that this was on um, coming up, and I didn't have time to, or didn't think okay. to com communicate Thank that to everybody. So, my sincere respects um, and to Jamie and regret to the rest of the board. Um, Councilors, are there other pressing questions that you have for tonight? Um, to again reset the table for tomorrow. Um, we will have opportunity to continue, um, tie off loose ends. If there are questions that went unanswered that we have the opportunity to get more information about, we'll try and bring that forward. We also tomorrow have, uh, and, and I should say to the school board, our plan is to uh, you know, complete discussion around the items specific to the school budget. Um, but then there are a few other items that we plan to discuss. You all are welcome to stay and listen to that discussion, but also don't need to be party to it either. Um, so anyway, I turn back to the council. Are there questions that you feel pressing for tonight, Jessica? Well, no, we're running, we're out of time, but I, I will be very interested. I'm, I don't understand the issues with the custodian. Um, and uh, so I'd like to hear more about that because I, I really don't quite understand that. Um, it seems to me that a, 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 a safety resource officer in the schools, a police officer for safety reasons, would be a, a higher priority than a custodian. And I know we have, you know, we share services and resources. So, I, you know, I'm hoping to hear more about that. And I know I, I intended to ask that a little earlier, but so actually, go there I, tomorrow night. I think that's a good... A, a good way to wrap would be if people have known questions that they'd like to pose now um, that also might allow for better preparation of answers and material for tomorrow. So we've got one on the issue of the custodian. We can delve in on the SRO a little bit more. The technology. 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 Yeah. I also had a yeah. question, uh, some questions about the bond and um, whether by not doing the feasibility study this year we lose out on anything, what the pros and cons are to pushing okay. that out. Okay, and I know we also have a planned meeting. It's more specifically to talk about the safety um, and I think um, physical plant, um, some of, for, for example, the generator, that's, that's next Monday. Okay, so there'll be additional opportunity to specifically talk about that, but was there something else, Sarah? I just had a quick question, maybe that's for Matt. Um, can you look back in the history of how we, the town's fund balance, and, and, and did, I, I remember we a few times, or at least one time I remember, sort of borrowed from it to help when the percentage was gonna be very high um, with a lot of restrictions and so forth. And I think we did that and then it ended up getting back. Anyway, my question is, in the past 10 years, have we used any of the town's fund balance during a tight budget season to help um, with the budget and reducing the percentage to the taxpayers, and how did that happen, and, and how did it end? How do we get rebuild the fund balance, or five years, or whatever, whatever would be helpful? 
Not within the past five years. Ten years. Uh, with ten years, I'll have to respond on that question. No, I'm saying that's a question for tomorrow night. Yeah, tomorrow and I just I need, need a quick reminder because I remember there was conversation about that at some point. So I think as a broader topic, and just one second, Jessica, as a broader topic, and you know, Matt and I were, I, I asked him a side question, sidebar question while we we're here. I think it would be worthwhile to discuss tomorrow because um, I had the very same notion. Is, is there some way that we can have supplemental revenue without impacting directly impacting a tax increase. And Matt has pointed out a few things that in our long range planning we should be aware of and mindful of that um, are just counterbalancing priorities for lack of a better term. So, so maybe we have that as the second part of tomorrow night's conversation. I just I, thought that yeah. historical so I think if we, thing if we would be helpful. Some of that tomorrow. Because yeah. I can't remember well enough. So I, I think it, in a short term view, You'd say absolutely in a even just even medium term view. It, it's. It, I'm, I'm not. I'm not pr proposing it. I'm no, strictly I asking the question out of curiosity. I asked I ask the question because yeah. I'm. I'm trying I just to want turn the information. Over. Have we yeah. done it? When did we do it? Why did we do it? And how did it work out? Yeah, and specific to what we have now and whether or not it makes sense to do that. I, you know, I certainly asked the question relative to have we turned over every couch cushion and turned over every rock for possible revenue sources and right. so anyway so Jessica uh, yeah, I just had two things that hopefully we can address tomorrow night um, I like Valerie I've got some questions and very some concerns about the the feasibility funding two hundred fifty thousand dollars and also in the budget you have CIP uh, figures but I was hoping to see a full, of a full of counting, a full accounting. This was done, this was paid, this is done. And, and I'm, re I'm referencing the municipal audit and, and those issues. We were hoping to see this last year, we didn't. And so I'm hoping to, you might be able to address some of that tomorrow night. You do have a list of things, but I wasn't able to tell what has been expense, what has been completed, what is now off the books. So maybe tomorrow night you could help me with that. Go ahead. So am I correct that you're asking about last year or what's proposed for the coming year? Well, actually both. I mean, I, I was hoping last year I asked for where are we with the school CIP plan? What have you, because we bonded money for that, some of that for you. And um, it was before you arrived, Howard, but I was hoping to see this is everything that's been expensed and taken care of, especially considering what you are now asking for the potentially wanting to ask taxpayers in the very near future. So in these expenses here, I see it, I see line items, but I don't see what is what was done, what is finished, what's off the books. That's what I was hoping to see. Can I make a small comment? Heather. Um, I heard you say that you bonded it for you meaning the school board, but I would like to say that in spirit of the community and the group effort that we're trying to communicate here, it's in bonding for all of us, not just the school board, but the town council, the people in the town, for the schools and the community. So just a small clarification on word there. It, it felt like a very, yeah. Well, I, I appreciate that. I, w I was looking at some of your documentation and where you list bond items, but you know, I understand that. I, you know, I just think that as we look at our books with the town, we, so should we be able to see this clearly you know, on the school side as well. I You're agree. right. The this, bond was for everybody, not just the school board, but because the, the work for the schools was for the whole community. So I agree other, we should be articulating and documenting well. Are there other questions that anybody wants to put on the table now for previewing for tomorrow? No. Um, before we go, Catherine, I want to thank you, um, and I know the staff uh, put a tremendous amount of time and work and effort into the materials that we have here. Um, thank you very much for that. In particular, I know a request that's been made in the past, which was great this year, the numbered pages, a lot more easy to follow along, okay. all that kind of stuff. So um, really just, you know, thank you. We know it's a lot of work and, and we appreciate it. So, all right. Um, anybody else? Okay. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Sarah, second, Caitlin, all those in favor? Great, we'll see you back here tomorrow at seven o'clock. Thank you. Thank you.